Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. We are going to begin today's meeting with the Central Park Central Community Facilities District Board meeting. Will the clerk please call the roll? Board Member Conlin. Board Member Conlin. Here. Thank you. Board Member DeCicio. Here. Board Member Garcia. Here. Board Member Gervais. Board Member Nowakowski. Here. Board Member Pastor. I apologize. Board Member Pastor. Here. Thank you. Board Member Stark. Here. Board Member Waring. Here. Board Member Williams. Here. Vice Chair Guardado. Here. Chairwoman Gallego. Here. Thank you all for joining us. Board Member Conlon, do you have a motion on the meeting minutes of June 3rd, 2020 and June 17, 2020? Um, I move acceptance of those two dates of uh, oh. meetings. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Uh, Board Member Conlon, do you have a motion on item number four, a resolution? Uh, I do. I move that item number four resolution regarding the Park Central Community Facilities District. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Conlin. Conlin. Aye. Thank you. DeCicio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Gervais. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. No. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Pass is 9 1. That concludes the business of the Park Central Community Facilities District. Thank you to board member Conlin. We will now adjourn the meeting of the Community Facilities District, and I will call to order the formal meeting of the Phoenix City Council for September 2nd, 2020. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilman DeCicio. Here. Council member Garcia. Here. Councilman Nowakowski. Here. Councilwoman Pastor. Here. Councilwoman Stark. Here. Councilman Waring. Here. Councilwoman Williams. Here. Vice Mayor Guardado. Here. Mayor Gallego. Here. Thank you all for joining us. We have an interpreter here today to assist with Spanish language translation. Elsie uh, Duarte, would you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Mayor Gallego. My name is Elsie Duarte, and I will be interpreting today's meeting. I would like to request for the speakers to slow down or pause when they make their statements. This will allow for interpretation to catch up with what is being said. Thank you. Wonderful. And would you like to make that same announcement in Spanish? Yes. Would you be willing to say what you said, but say it in Spanish? Yes, I can. Favor de hacer pausas a la hora de hablar. Esto permite tiempo para que sus declaraciones sean interpretadas. Gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Will the city clerk please read the 24-hour paragraph? The titles of the following ordinance and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore may be read by title or agenda item only. 
ordinances numbered G6703 and 6725 through 6735, S46854 and 46894 through 46909, and resolutions 21857 through 21860. Many thanks. Councilwoman Williams, have you had a chance to review the meeting minutes from October 2nd, 2019, and do you have a motion? I have, and I believe them to be uh, correct. Move approval. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Minutes are approved unanimously. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion related to boards and commissions? Yes, we have a motion to approve Mayor and City Council boards and commissions nominations. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion on liquor licenses? Yes, I have a motion to approve items three through five, except item five. Second. Second. Any discussion? We need a roll call on this one. No, Mayor. I thought we did, Mayor. Okay, Mayor, you can I'll do a voice call. vote. We... Oh. we can do a roll call if you would All like. Right, Mayor. Then... No, if, if we can do a voice vote, let's just do a voice vote. All those in favor, please signal aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. We next turn to item number five, which is Roses by the Stairs Brewing. We do have members of the public here to address the council. If everyone is okay with that, I'll begin with public comment. Uh, and we will begin with um, Catherine Kunberger. Hello, am I muted? Nope, we can hear you. Okay, hi, my name is Katherine Kunberger, and I own a home at 528 West Linwood Street, which is on the north side of Linwood Street. The alley behind my house uh, is it abuts the businesses along McDowell. Um, in order to qualify for a liquor license, the applicant bears the burden of demonstrating that the grant of the license is in the best interest of the community. I submit that you're hearing from the community here today. There's 11 homeowners and residents on the block immediately adjacent to this brewery. We're telling you it's not in our best interest to allow this brewery with this plan in this location. This is not a standard bar restaurant with beer and alcohol sales. We have those. We have a lot of them. In fact, right behind my house, there's the corner uh, of McDowell and, and 7th Street. There's, I think, 10 restaurants abutting that corner. Uh, we have a brand new one going in in the former Zoe's building, a bar restaurant with outdoor patio sales. Um, this is not an area that has a, a desperate need for more alcohol uh, sales. The, we certainly have plenty of places to go and enjoy a beer. But we're a neighborhood. There's, there's people who live here. There's people who live on Linwood directly behind this brewery. This block, this, this 500 block, the very block where this brewery is being planned, has seven kids under 12 that live on the block behind this planned brewery. There's a, a few other, six or seven, I think, other teenagers uh, who are probably all off to college, but they live here. Uh, there's an elementary school just two and a half, three blocks up the road. There's a high school right across the intersection from this planned brewery. But we are more than just any neighborhood. We're Phoenix's oldest historic district. We're a point of pride for the city. Hans Park, the Japanese Garden, the Irish Cultural Center. We have numerous homes on the historic registry. Why does that matter? I actually just think it's terrible history about keeping a cultural treasure like the historic Rosa neighborhood as a vibrant residential area. So the city has to protect the livability of the area for those of us who have invested, for those of us who have put, you know, our lives on the line to keep this area vibrant. Thank our you. Homes are not new high. Uh, we will have uh, Patricia followed by Rachel Davis, and then our final speaker will be the applicant, uh, Jordan Hamm. Uh, so Patricia, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mayor. Can everyone hear me okay? 
We can. Thank you. I appreciate that. My name is Patricia Zermeno. I live at 518 West Linwood. My back gate of the property that I live on and own is 30 feet from the back door of the proposed brewery, retail sale, and uh, beer patio. I don't think that this is a business that is in the best interest of the community. This community was one that no one wanted to live in many years ago. I would say probably about the time we moved in, almost uh, 26 years ago. Those of us who've lived here for a long time and those of us who've lived here even for kind of a short time, five years, three years, have worked pretty hard to make this a neighborhood. In fact, we've been really successful at it, I think, because look at the growth around us. Things are popping up all around us. My concern and my reasons for not thinking that this applicant should have a liquor license are these. We have five or six area businesses within walking distance where I can go get a beer or the drink of my choice. This brewery doesn't provide anything that I think is in benefit to my community. I don't think that the applicant has done enough to secure that our residences and the buffer alley that we share is going to be protected from his patrons or the delivery of goods and services to the bar, the patio, and the brewery. I don't know what a microbrewery smells like, but I can't find any other microbrewery within the city limits uh, that is like the one that's going to be butt up right against the historic district in Phoenix that is the oldest historic district. And with that, I will yield my time to Rachel. I thank you very much for listening to me, and I appreciate your time and your service to our Phoenix. Thank you. Uh, Rachel will be next, followed by Jordan Hamm. Hi, my name is Rachel Davis. My husband and I own our home at 510 West Linwood Street, which is directly behind the applicant address at 509 West McDowell. I support the creativity and the good intentions of the applicant, and you'll, you'll meet him soon. He's a very passionate and interesting guy. However, I have concerns about the potential impact of the microbrewery on the adjacent neighbors, such as parking and alley traffic. And I would ask that the applicant continue to work with the neighbors to address these concerns so that everybody can be on the same page moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our final speaker on this topic is Jordan. Hi, everyone. Thank you for your time. Um, I, I am the owner of the brewery. I received a lot of new information this morning and as recently as an hour ago around neighborhood concerns. Uh, coming out of the permit approval process, my understanding was that, we, was that we had reached a compromise with our neighbors through stipulations in our use permit and that we had vetted our brewery to an appropriate use on the McDowell corridor. We were happy to support, we, we received much support from many people in the area. However, I learned this week that there are resolvable issues that we could address to gain support of this neighborhood. We want to fully understand and mediate these concerns and demonstrate our commitment to being good neighbors. We are going through the appropriate city process. We have received our use permit approval and the city has vetted that our brewery was an appropriate use for the McDowell corridor. We are confirming to the, conforming to the stipulations given in the use permit, which were part of the city's compromise with the neighborhood. We are in process of going through the city's planning and development process where we will be abiding by all the city codes and standards, including many of the items mentioned and, and uh, the noise and the alley buffering. We do not have final approval from planning and development yet, but once we do, we will be more than happy to share that information with the neighbors. Uh, we do not provide any additional hardships to the neighbors or community than our next door business neighbor who was recently approved. We will produce less smell. That was mentioned earlier. We, we have no smell to our brewery. We have less waste. We will be a zero waste facility and less traffic in the business next door. Ultimately, we are acting in the best interest of the community by providing safety in an abandoned alley and warehouse, being a zero waste facility and giving back to local charities and creating jobs. We will bring over $25,000 in revenue to this local corner because we will not be serving beer or not to be serving food. We're a small business navigating the legal process as best as we can. With so many pieces to start a business, we are not a large corporation. We are committed to being good neighbors. We would like to request a continuance. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Jordan, for being willing to uh, work with the community on this. Um, I will, uh, let's see, I guess, turn to Councilman Nowakowski, who uh, represents the area. 
Um, thank you, Mayor. So, Mayor, there's different processes that we go through to get a liquor license. One of the things is that there was a, they had a chance where the neighborhood actually came to the hearing to basically talk about the concerns that they had. The stipulations were never added into um, into the documents that were there and the special use permits. So, um, so saying that, um, I'm very concerned that they haven't been able over from July till now to come up with an agreement. Um, the concern is that we have one of the oldest um, neighborhoods that once the, the I-10 went through there, there was a whole revitalization of that whole neighborhood. Uh, put in a lot of time into the Margaret Hans Park and just beautifying that whole area. And about four years ago, this whole neighborhood had a big hit when it came to putting some restaurants, some restaurants that were needed, some restaurants that a lot of people enjoy and that were very popular, but we didn't think they were gonna be that popular that we ran out of parking, right? So I know that we have some overlays in the city of Phoenix, but then we had to really look at Lingwood which is the following the street right behind these businesses and actually put up some signs to um, to make sure that people weren't parking in people's driveways on the streets, double parking and all that. And this neighborhood was really interrupted with those uh, restaurants going in there with the um, inadequate amount of parking. So that's something that we as a city need to address in the future when we're looking at um, allowing businesses to go in if they, I know that there's certain overlays that we have being close to the light rail, but we're not really there as Phoenicians. We love to use our cars. And if there's a great restaurant or a brewery, we'd like to go to that, right? So um, I hear the concerns of the neighbors. We have 20 parkings and in that facility, there's gonna be four different businesses. So basically the concern also is where are the employees gonna park? If there's only 20 parkings, four businesses, um, they're going to take up half the parking of just the, the uh, employees alone. The other concern is that um, we have a problem right now with um, individuals wandering through the alleys, defecating and all that, that they believe that this might even increase having businesses open till two in the morning. Um, the concerns of security for the neighborhood, children that have um, school on, on the weekends, on the weekdays that, um, the hours of the business being open, um, an outdoor patio that um, they're concerned about the noise. So the list goes on and on. Uh, since July to now, there hasn't been anything in writing. There's been a lot of verbal stuff. So with that, I, I need to side with the community. Uh, we've been trying to work these problems out and I'm gonna be a no on this um, liquor license. Um, that's just a recommendation, just letting Jordan Jordan's been um, a really good person to work with. Um, he's, um, it's his first business. And um, this is something that we as the city of Phoenix are basically giving a recommendation to the liquor, to the state liquor board. So you still have a, a second chance at that level. So I like to make a recommendation of not approving this liquor license. Thank second. you, Councilman. Any, um... So we have a motion to deny and a second. Uh, any council member comments? I, I, I would like to ask a question. Um, Councilwoman Pastor. The applicant had asked if it could be continued uh, for them to work with the neighborhood. Did I hear that correctly or am I, uh, did I hear something wrong? Yes, I think I ran out of time there. I would like to ask for a continuance to bring in a mediator and speak with the neighborhood and try and work and resolve these issues so we can be great neighbors in writing and make sure it's binding because I think that is one of their concerns. I was, una I was unaware that the email I sent after our permit hearing was not binding, so I would like to work with them and get things written down in binding so um, we can be good neighbors. So my second question is to the councilman, um, or do you just want to continue with it or uh, do we need a second uh, or a friendly amendment or I don't know what uh, to see if they can continue it. But the, the question is to, is, uh, 
to staff is if they have enough time to continue it. So a couple questions, um, Mayor, just to follow through with um, Council Member Pastor. Um, is Alan Stevens around? Because um, the special use permit, um, they had the opportunity at that time to actually put in these stipulations. And for some reason, the applicant didn't want to put those um, stipulations in at that time. We had a continuance from last uh, formal to now to try to work those things out. So I was told that there, that period has passed. I'm not sure if Alan, is there a way to put those stipulations still in that um, special use permit or not? Mayor Councilman Nowakowski, um, the uh, appeal period for uh, this case uh, at 509 West McDowell Road is up on uh, September 4th. Um, and so there was a 15 day appeal period in effect from when that hearing originally took place. So uh, the neighbors or the applicant could appeal that decision. It would go to the Board of Adjustment, whereby they could ask for the stipulations to be uh, added in. I do know that there were some stipulations in there that are not legally enforceable, and I think that was some of the concern of the hearing officer as it relates to the, the, the request before them, which was for uh, the microbrewery outdoor liquor service and uh, retail sales of liquor within the McDowell Road Character District. And so there were things the neighbors wanted about trash collection in the alley and other things that really are, um, are, would be difficult to enforce in a use permit hearing and that's why they weren't adopted. But certainly uh, an appeal would have the applicant sit back down with the, the neighbors to uh, try and see if they could reach some other uh, compromise on the matter. So, Alan, it was my understanding that some of the um, the neighbors were asking for in some stuff that we could actually put in stipulations, like making sure that security cameras aren't pointing into their backyards and other things like that. That um, the the applicant um, basically said no, that they didn't want to put that in as a stipulation. Is that correct? Councilman, uh, my understanding is that there was some discussion with the applicant about some of those matters and they were not willing to, to do it at that time. You're, you're correct. And, and also um, the um, parking situation, if there is gonna be an overflow parking, there is no type of uh, agreement or any type of a plan for that also. So my, my, my thing is that there was plenty of time to sit down and talk um, we're at the 11th hour, and I believe that we've given the chance for the neighbors and the applicant to sit down and have that conversation. And um, I like to continue with my uh, recommendation of, of disapproval. Any additional comments? Roll call. Decisio. Yes. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? I apologize. Waring? Yes. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9-0. That concludes the liquor license portion of our agenda. City Clerk, are we ready for ordinances, resolutions, new business planning and zoning? Yes, Mayor. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Yes, we do. Um, motion to approve items 6 through 42, except the following. Items 17, 19, 21, 38, 39, 40, and 42. Item 41 is continued to December 2nd, 2020, and excluding these items for public comment 38, 39, 40, and 42. Did I get that right? Yes, Vice Mayor, you did. 
I will second. We have a motion and a second. Any comments or additions? Roll call. DeCicio. DeCicio. Which one are his? Garcia. Yes. Thank you, Councilman DeCicio and, and Garcia. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9 0. Thank you. We next move to item 17, which is a Terrazzo project at Sky Harbor Airport. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve item 17. Second. We have a motion and a second. This is an exciting project. We had a great community panel with expertise from our city and great public art cities such as Denver's. There will be a nice welcome to Sky Harbor. The public art is often one of the first impressions of our city. So I am looking forward to supporting this. Any questions or comments from the council before we vote? Roll call. Decisio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. No. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 8 1. Thank you. We next move to item 19, Wilson Electric Surface Corporation contract amendment. We do have uh, one member of the public, well, uh, of one member of our community here to address us today on this. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with public comment uh, and then we'll come to council member comments and a motion, uh, Mario Ayala. Hi, Mayor, can you hear me? We can. All right, perfect. Mayor and City Council, my name is Mario Ayala, and I am the proud president of Ask Me Local 2384. Local 2384 supports 1,500 uh, employees of the City of Phoenix and Unit 2 and over 96 classifications. My job as president is to ensure that the contract between the city and the union is upheld. It is also to look for ways of efficiency within the city to help save costs, eliminating redundant spending by finding ways for work to be performed by our staff. Mm -hmm. During this pandemic and through these difficult times, the city and the ratepayers can use all the savings possible. Unfortunately, item 19, uh, the Wilson Electric contract creates a redundant spending while infringing on the work of the bargaining unit. Similar to the Felix construction contract, the Water Services Department has once again failed to honor our MOU. They have accepted a contract that started at 983,000 and is now asking for an additional 700,000 to complete the project with little to no oversight. This savings could reduce the ratepayers and decrease costs that would unfortunately be by, be passed on to the ratepayers. The Wilson Electric contract presents the same violations as the Felix construction contract, which eventually led to an unfair labor practice as possible violations of our ordinance. Recently, the Phoenix Relations Board, the Phoenix Employment Relations Board, sorry, unanimously decided to send the union's claim forth to a hearing officer. We believe that the concerns of the board are in line with the union. The city could contract all of the work of Unit 2 and that would place that would decrease morale and place employees' future at risk. The ask here is simple: to save the ratepayers unnecessary by allowing the employees to perform this work in house. I once again ask that you meet that your words are met with actions, and you vote to properly vet this contract for the ratepayers and the employees as well. Thank you. 
Thank you. I will turn to council first for a motion and then comments. Do we have a motion on item 19? Mayor? Yes, um, we have a motion to approve item 19, but I had some comments on this. Wonderful. Let us see if we have a second and then I will turn to the vice mayor for comments. I will second it. Wonderful. Thank you. So we have a, a motion from the vice mayor, a second from Councilwoman Williams, vice mayor, comments or questions. So, um, so I just, you know, like just wanted to, um, I know that a few months ago, um, we talked about um, doing an analyzing, um, especially in the, in the water department, what is some of the opportunities um, that we could give to some of the members. Like, I understand that there's certain work that's always gonna have to be um, outsourced just because there's a, a specific skill set that's needed um, to be able to do that work. Um, but I do strongly recommend that we do move forward um, in the different departments. Um, I know that we have a commitment from the water department to really analyze um, what is the skill set that we can teach workers that we right now have working for the city I'm trying to figure out how do we do less outsourcing, which I think does does come out for a savings for for the city, right? If if we're able to do that, so I'm I'm just hoping that we do continue um, to move forward on checking and analyzing what's the work that we can do in house. How do we give that training to the workers that we already have? So we can um, make sure that we're able to save some money, but then at the same time, making our employees feel um, that at the city, there's different ways for them to be able to progress in their in their careers, and that there's like different skill sets that they can also that they can also learn. So I just wanted to put that on the record. I don't know if there's anyone there from the water department, just to try and see um, where we're at with that. You know, with, with that list and and when is that going to be completed? Mayor. Mayor, I'd like to make comments. Perfect. I think we have comments from Councilman Williams and Stark. Um, first, I will see if there is if staff can answer uh, the vice mayor's question. Or vice mayor, you were, were you looking for? Yeah, you were yeah looking I was for, looking yeah. forward to see. Mayor, Vice Mayor, we have uh, Deputy City Manager Karen Peters and Water Services Director Katherine Sorensen here for the Vice Mayor's questions. Hi, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, thank you so much um, for letting me answer these questions today. Yeah, actually this work is well underway. Um, I have started on it personally. I have tasked my employees with gathering all of our relevant service contracts. Um, not just our service contracts, but the ones in other departments like public works and aviation that we spend against and the, contra the service contracts that other departments uh, spend against ours so that we have a very comprehensive picture of what exactly we're uh, doing in-house and what exactly we're contracting. I'm grouping them into categories based on the needs for those contracts. So for example, software, proprietary systems, specialized equipment, specialized skills, um, we do have, uh, across the city, there are thousands of service contracts. In water services, um, in the last few years, um, we have spent against approximately eight, no, I'm sorry, 650 of them. Uh, so the work is underway. It will take some time uh, to gather all of that information and then do the analysis about what the savings could potentially be. It is important to realize that contracts such as the one before you are not duplicative spending unless it is the case that our employees are not fully employed with their current tasks. I can assure you that is not the case. They are fully employed working on our assets. We can also assure you that contrary to what was said, there is oversight over these contracts. Ms. Sorensen and her staff are very fully engaged with this contract. There is oversight over the Wilson Electric Services contract. In fact, the oversight is why we're here today because they're monitoring it on a, a daily and weekly basis. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just question for Catherine. Catherine, how many unfilled positions do we have right now in the water department? Our vacant, uh, Vice Mayor, uh, our vacancy rate uh, is gener generally around 10 to 13 percent. Um, I don't know at this particular point in time, but that's been pretty stable over the last several years. 
Um, I think you're very familiar with um, our efforts to recruit employees, but for the benefit of the rest of the council, I'll explain that we have a near continual recruitment process. Um, we have also asked the Human Resources Department to um, go through salary studies and compensation studies to make sure that we are compensating employees adequately for skills so that we can actually recruit and retain employees in the Water Services Department. I would also note that um, last, I'm sorry, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, the years blend, uh, but we did ask for additional Unit 2 employees in the Water Services Department. Um, our intent is to build and to maintain um, the employees that we have to provide them with adequate professional and technical and safety training to successfully do their jobs. And then, and then my second question um, is, when do you think that, I, I mean, I know that stuff, I mean, other things take time. Um, like, when do you think that analysis will be complete or by when do you think we'll have some numbers um, to look at? Um, I certainly, I would be ready to come probably um, in the later part of September to at least give the council an overview of our different service contracts and the service contracts in, for example, public works, aviation, um, parks, and other departments that we spend against. Um, we could at least give a broad overview of what's out there, the categories that they fall into, their average annual spend, you know, the purpose for them, why we rely on them, that kind of thing. But I don't think at that point in time I would have an economic analysis ready to determine which contracts make sense to potentially insource or which um, duties make sense to outsource. Great. And then the other, my final thought is that, um, I think I said this to you before, is that let us know how we can be helpful. I know that there's like over 40 positions that, that need to be filled and that are needed to be filled. So whatever we can do to be helpful um, to promote or whatever it is that we need to do to help with that recruitment, just, just let us know because I know that that's something that's important. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, thank you. That is very gracious, and we're super excited about working with your office to really connect with the community and make sure the people who are looking for jobs are able to find um, jobs in our department that fit their skill set. So thank you. I appreciate that. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I think I saw Councilwoman Williams first, and then we'll go to Councilwoman Stark. Uh, I have a question for Catherine. This is not a new contract. It is an ongoing contract. Did I understand that right? Uh, Mayor, Councilwoman, that's correct. Um, this, from the records we've been able to find, um, this uh, security system was installed back in 2007 by contractors. It has since been maintained by contractors as well. Um, this contract, this current contract was approved by the Phoenix City Council in 2017 and we are asking for additional spending authority on a previously approved contract. It's still within uh, the contract bid amount. I mean, we're not adding to the contract. No, Mayor, right. Councilwoman, we, it's still within the time frame of the original contract. We are asking for additional spending authority. Um, we've been taking a very deep dive and looking at the security needs of our infrastructure. There have been recent um, revised federal guidelines regarding Homeland Security designated infrastructure. Um, so we're asking for additional authority to address those items. And I take it it takes a special talent or experience to be able to provide that service. Uh, Mayor, uh, Councilwoman, yeah. So our staff, uh, we use our staff to troubleshoot and do um, the repairs that they are able to do. Um, but once um, the complexity of the system and the, the programming, um, other needs go beyond what our employees are able to do, then we do rely on a contractor. The contractor has to be manufacturer certified to work on this system. It is a very specialized system. Thank you. I just think it's very important we keep our water safe and we keep Homeland Security happy. And what, what Ms. Sorensen said is important to know, we have very talented employees, uh, Ms. Sorensen has many of them, uh, and, and there are some security systems in the city of aviation, for example, there's one security system where our employees are able to maintain it. As Ms. Sorensen noted, this is a, is a proprietary specialized one that requires certification. That is why we need the contract to have that, um, that certif certification in place. 
Thank you, Mayor. Councilwoman Stark. Thanks. Um, I just want to make sure that we're uh, working with uh, AFSCME and you're allowing them to look at these contracts as they come up, um, just to give them a little bit of um, discussion. And 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 what's happening, I, I see, is that as soon as we post the agenda, then Mario will contact us, and it's kind of short notice. So is there a way that you can work with the union before it's even on an agenda so that you're vetting their concerns? Yes, Mayor, uh, Councilwoman Stark, we do on a monthly basis sit down with all of the labor organizations to go okay. through the things that are coming forward in the following month. That is okay. one opportunity. Of course, there are probably many other opportunities that we will avail ourselves of so that everyone feels very much informed. And Mayor, okay, I Councilman Stark, it. yes, uh, to, to be fair to Mr. Ayala, we had a process in place uh, that uh, uh, Ms. Jonovich, before she retired, she was leading that for me. That was one thing that fell through the cracks, unfortunately, for okay. me when uh, she left. And so that's on me. So uh, I now have a deputy city manager, Tony Macaron, is leading that effort whereby every month our departments, including water, a, uh, aviation, streets, sit down, public works, sit down with all the labor leaders, including AFSCME two and three, to go over what's coming up in the next month on contracts. And so okay. we resumed that process yesterday and had that opportunity for the month of September. So to your point, Councilwoman, that, that is resumed. And that was something okay. that had been missed last week, which was why um, I agreed that we should um, request you to, to continue it. And then I had a discussion yesterday with Mr. Ayala about a bigger con, uh, uh, discussion about contracts generally, and we are going to have a labor management process where we will sit down with, with the labor groups and talk through much earlier in the process what it is that we're looking at contracting to, un, to educate each other about why we're doing that, what the purpose is, and to understand if the unions have the, the belief that there are places where they, they should do the work or can do the work, we can have that dialogue, but we wanna do it much earlier, so farther upstream than, as you said, the week before the council meeting. So right. I committed to Mr. Ayala yesterday that, that we would do that for contracts moving forward. Excellent, I appreciate that. Um, I think that'll help uh, and it will solve some of the problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Any additional council member comments? Mayor. Mayor. Councilman Nowakowski. Thank you, Mayor. So basically it's my understanding that the employees continue to troubleshoot the system and perform minor repairs. But when it comes to some type of expertise and fixing something, that's when we use the um, an outside um, outsourcing it or an outside expertise. Is that correct, Catherine? Uh, Mayor, council member, yes, that's correct. And then the other thing we're talking about is um, warranties and certification, right? So is there a way in the future to actually um, start that certification of our own employees? Um, I know that we have systems that are probably going to have to be updated, and then maybe in the up updating those systems, we can actually look into um, using our own employees to be certified to upkeep those systems and making sure that um, we can try to save costs if, if possible, right? Uh, Mayor, council member, absolutely. That's exactly the kind of conversation that I would envision we would have, right? Um, we wanna make sure that we're always uh, keeping apprised of our core functions. There are certain things that we should always be doing that are part of the, the maintenance, repair, and rehabilitation of our infrastructure. But then there are other things that probably are a little bit too far away from our core function for us to perform. So for example, an armored car services. We currently have a service contract for armored car services. Should we be in the armored car services industry? I mean, probably not. Um, but there are things that are just our bread and butter. And that's exactly the type of conversation that I think that we should have. Where this contract would fall in particular, I can't say off the top of my head, um, but that would be the exact kind of process and analysis that we would like to go through. So, Catherine, basically, we're using our city staff to the fullest or the greatest possibility that we can use them and that we're using expertise that we don't have within the city of Phoenix and we outsource those um, types of services, right? Uh, Mayor, Councilmember, 
Yes, uh, that's, it, that is certainly our intent. And yes, absolutely, our employees are fully employed. So we can't necessarily save money by bringing the worst work in-house if they are already fully employed doing core function tasks. That's the kind of analysis we need to go through. All right, thank you. Marathon Pastor. So um, on this contract, and I understand that it's a, a contract and um, we need to add some additional dollars. Um, I feel like there's two different conversations going on in, in this uh, piece. One is addi adding additional dollars for the expertise, but the second conversation is really comes back to professional development and training. And I would like to see the program that has been uh, worked on uh, by other uh, policy maker or policy groups like LIUNA, where there's an apprenticeship program and uh, different pieces where uh, professional development and additional certification is being done while they're still maintaining their job at the level that they are, and then be able to move up uh, up the uh, scale. I feel like, yes, there's particular certification, but that doesn't mean that we cannot uh, work with the company and do an in-house certification. So then there is really truly a check and balance of making sure and oversight of making sure the company is doing or saying what they're, they're supposed to be doing. And we have someone internally understanding the system and being able to say, I think this is wrong. I think this is wrong, however it works. But I don't know how the checks and balances work if uh, there's nobody within the city that is certified to see the checks and balances or understand the checks and balances. Uh, Mayor, oh. Councilwoman, yes, thank you. Uh, we do participate in uh, the apprenticeship programs. We have one, uh, we participate with the city's electrician apprenticeship program. We also have one through Gateway where we're trying to um, work with people who are willing to change their career, become operators um, of our systems. And we would like very much to expand those apprenticeship programs. They are very important to us and they help us get additional resources into our department. Um, regarding oversight, absolutely there is oversight on this contract and I, I really want to give a shout out to our employees and our process control and supervisory control and data acquisition group. They are the ones, the professionals who oversee this contract. Um, they are responsible for our remote data acquisition and our human machine interface across all of our facilities. It's an amazing group of professionals um, and I promise you that they, they have very strong oversight over this contract and work directly with this uh, contractor to make sure that the work is done to a high quality. I'm very grateful for their work. Um, but I think what I, I think we lost the point of what I'm trying to make. What I'm trying to say is that we need internal people to get certified in these areas so that then we have people within our own ranks to be certified, understanding this uh, technology, this machinery, and all these other pieces, so that then we don't necessarily always have to uh, go out and uh, ask for other expertise or ask for them to come in and fix whatever's needed. I am, I am, I am saying we really need to do an analyzation of the department uh, of seeing where the gaps are, which I thought we've already done because I've been on this, uh, I think for the last, when I entered, uh, started asking how come we're not certifying, how come we're not doing, I was one, uh, one pushing. And I feel like we're back to the same conversation and the same point at this moment. Uh, so I'm, what I'm asking um, is that we really do have a policy or a study group and have a deep dive as to what is happening with the with the the vacancies how can we improve those vacancies how can we get people in there start where we need to start them and then move them through all the other vacancies uh, or however I, I continue to hear it's really hard to get people in. It's continue uh, hard to recruit. Uh, 
I think HR needs to come in and really help us with this piece and have an understanding. Um, and my, I want to say we voted on something like that uh, a while back, but I can go back and look in my box uh, memory. But I, I think what you're hearing from the council that it, it's very important uh, we continue to make sure uh, items stay within our within our house, within the city, basically. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's value in looking at our HR practices. Uh, the water department has had some great success with our uh, policy that we often call ban the box at the city of Phoenix and has been able to recruit some, uh, as I understand, excellent employees who might not have succeeded with a traditional background check. And so we, I think, have some success stories that I would like to celebrate and I think would be meaningful and consistent with this community's value to that hard work matters and that um, so uh, we, ought, we ought to do better as well about sharing good news. I see value in being strategic about who is doing what job. I, I don't know that we have the professional expertise to uh, operate armored cars. And so I think having business partners that, that do that does make sense. Um, so it'll be an, an interesting um, analysis and perhaps one that may make sense for the transportation and infrastructure subcommittee if its members are are interested. Uh, Council Member Garcia, did you wish to provide comments? Sure, I just wanted to echo some of my colleagues are saying, uh, encourage as much in-house uh, development as we can have. I'm looking forward to looking at the survey and the, that's coming up um, to, to make sure that whatever we can do in-house we do. And I also appreciate Ed, you recognizing the, the break in communication and, and hopefully uh, we can continue to communicate well with our, our employees at the city of Phoenix, keep their morale up um, and make sure that we you know, uh, encourage their development and their growth. So um, I'll be supporting this, but with uh, the caveat that we'd be paying attention to this and really wanna focus on, on getting our own workers to do and learn this type of work. Uh, Mayor, council member, yes, thank you. I agree completely. As I've said before, it's been many years since the city really took a broad view um, regarding what we do in-house and what we do through contractors. Um, I think it will be a good conversation and I look forward to it. Thank you. Roll call. Cecilio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Dark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9-0. Thank you. Thank you. We next move to item 21, which is an intergovernmental agreement with Maricopa County for the Platinum Pass program. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve item 21. Second. We have a motion and a second. Councilman Waring, did you have any questions or comments on this item? I, I did. Uh, and I can't see if the staff, appropriate staff is there, but I'll just ask my question. Um, I just, is it fair to say that the item generates revenue at no cost for an already existing system? Is that a fair way to summarize this item or not? Mayor, uh, Councilman Waring, that is correct. This is an agreement with Maricopa County in order for them to be able to purchase platinum passes for their employees, whereby they, they distribute them to their employees and the employees can then utilize bus or light rail service throughout the region and then we uh, basically invoice them for the trips taken. Thank you. Um, I'll just say this, you know, I'm not a fan of light rail, but the parts that are built, I mean, might as well be utilized to the extent possible. So this is a good program that frankly, the revenue generated offsets costs that would otherwise go to taxpayers, correct? People don't buy tickets, then we gotta own all of it, but the more tickets they buy, the more they offset the cost, correct? 
Mayor Councilman Waring, that is correct. The more ridership we have, uh, the, be the more efficient our costs are for the overall system. Thank you, Mayor, I appreciate it. Thank you, Councilman. Any additional comments or questions? Roll call. Ducicio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 9 0. We now move to the planning and zoning portion of our agenda. For these agenda items, we will see, um, we will hear items 39 and 40 together. They are related cases. For items 38 and the two cases, uh, 39 and 40, we will each, for each one, have a 10 minute presentation from each side and then go to the cards. Uh, both items, we will begin with a staff report before we open the public hearing. We will move to item 38, which is the appeal of a hearing officer decision and the abandonment of the right of way at the northeast corner of 13th Place and Palo Mayor, Verde Drive. Yes. I thought I thought we had item 30, someone requested to speak. My understanding, it was the applicant who was in favor and very happy to be on consent, but I will turn okay. to Alan. Just to verify it, because we still called it 30 out. Mm -hmm. Ma Mayor, no, we uh, didn't. Council, I'm sorry, go ahead, Vice Mayor. I'm Mayor, sorry, that, that, yeah. was, uh, that was excluded. Yeah. I, I know that it showed up on the original, but when we did the motion, it was only 38, okay. 39, 40, and 42. Okay, thank you. I apologize. No, it's good that you helped me with this. I certainly would not want the case to not move forward because I, I failed at oversight, but the vice okay. mayor uh, was nimble and adaptable to this uh, particular item, so she got us a good, thank you. good motion. All right, so uh, we'll begin then. I think we're ready for the staff report on item 38. Mayor, let me uh, fast forward here. Item 38 is a appeal of abandonment hearing officer decision within uh, Council District uh, 6. This is just one item on the agenda for this matter. Uh, in this particular case, an abandonment uh, that you often see on Council is the formal uh, resolution of the public's interest in ownership of a property because most abandonments are not appealed to the City Council with a discussion of should the, uh, the property be abandoned or not. Those are satisfied at a hearing officer level. Um, however, if they can't be satisfied, they do come to the council for appeal, and that's what you have before you on item number 38. And so this is uh, an abandonment for a portion of 14th Street right-of-way shown in green on your screen here, as well as an alley that connects over to the 13th place uh, shown in yellow. Um, in, that, in this particular instance, uh, you see a picture of it uh, right here. There is a, a single family home that is back in behind the trees, uh, and then that parcel fronts all the way up to, to Bethany Home Road, where uh, there is an existing um, uh, home on there and a person who, is, uh, who lives there, um, and they're represented by Mr. Ben Graff, and Mr. Bill Lally represents the property owner on the single family home on the other side of the alley right here. Uh, in this particular case, uh, Mr. Graff's client uh, is under contract to sell that parcel for uh, redevelopment uh, in the future under the existing zoning. And the, the issue uh, it really is access on this 14th, um, uh, street, 14th street uh, right of way right here and, um, and then uh, access into that subdivision uh, in the future. Uh, this is the, the site plan uh, that again is uh, part of that future uh, possible development if the sale goes through from uh, Mr. Graff's client. Uh, the hearing officer decision did approve the uh, decision to uh, allow for the east-west portion of the alley to be um, abandoned, which was the area shown in yellow, and, but did not uh, approve the 14th Street right-of-way uh, area as well. And I'll show that here um, just in a map here. One. We'll jump right back here real fast. So again, the green area was not approved and the yellow area was approved. 
Uh, in this case, staff does recommend that the um, uh, abandonment hearing officer's decision be upheld. These are just the stipulations that were on there, should there be uh, the need to get into any of those and discuss them. Uh, with that, staff is happy to answer any questions. Do we have any questions for our planning and development director before we open the public hearing? I'll wait. I'll wait. Great. Uh, then we will open the public hearing. Uh, we will begin with two presentations of up to 10 minutes. Uh, first from Mr. Lally for the applicant, second from Mr. Graff for uh, the uh, neighbor. So, Mr. Lally, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I okay. at least do not see the presentation yet. Yeah, if you can bring up the presentation, that'd be great. In the meantime, uh, again, uh, for the record, Mayor and Council Members, uh, Bill Lally with Tiffany and Bosco, 2525 East Countback Road, representing uh, Jerry Mansour, the applicant on this property, uh, abandonment. Uh, as you uh, recall from the aerial that was on the uh, presentation, uh, Mr. Mansour's property is the White House that was off to the left, uh, as you saw the, the street view photo. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Lally. Uh, I'm yes. going to interrupt real quick. Uh, you have uh, presenter rights, so you have the ability to share the presentation. Uh, so okay. go ahead and pull that up, and then you can talk from there. That way, you can control it uh, as you go through your presentation. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. We can now see the PowerPoint. Okay, great. So again, as, as uh, Alan indicated, this is the location of the property. Um, the property is in two pieces. It's an alley uh, going east-west, a right-of-way that um, acts as an alley going north and south. The Mansour property uh, is highlighted in yellow. A little closer up shows uh, the location of the alley, location of the proposed right of way. Um, our, our position is, you know, Mr. Mansour and his young family have lived there for 18 years. For many uh, years, they've dealt with uh, illegal dumping, uh, crime, uh, people sleeping in the alley next to their property, people breaking into the home. And so, Finally, uh, Mr. Mansour, uh, in response to this, petitioned for the abandonment of the entire thing. Now, it coincided with the city's new policy of abandoning trash pickup uh, in the rear alley and abandoning uh, bulk trash, up, trash pickup in the side yard alley. Uh, once the city abandoned both of those, uh, there is no public need for either of those. All it was is an attractive nuisance for, uh, for crime, uh, for people dumping stuff there. And so for Jerry and his young family, it made a lot of sense to abandon that and close that off. The abandonment happened um, late last year. Uh, the, the hearing uh, was first held in May. The property owner uh, that Mr. Graff represents is identified here in as opposition. Mr. Graff attended the uh, May hearing and asked for a continuance because the landowner that he represented um, was not aware of the application. Uh, Mr. Mansour did reach out to all the appropriate neighbors, knocked on um, Ms. Fielder's door twice. Uh, the, the application went through uh, the process. She is an elder lady. Um, she's not necessarily going up and down 14th Street and interacting with the Mansour. Uh, family, they, there isn't a relationship there. So he tried twice to get a hold of her to let her know. Uh, but in reality, what you're going to hear today from the opposition is, is the uh, op opposing of the 14th Street right of way. Uh, the 14th Street right of way, uh, as you'll hear from the opposition, is, is proclaimed to be an important access point for the existing family there today. Um, no, at no time in the hearing processes did Mr. Graff claim to represent the future developer or the future developer's interest. They claim that the existing land right of that property owner is of utmost importance and they wanted to retain that. Now, I'll read you a quote from the hearing officer from Ms. Fielder. Ms. Fielder stated, 
that the alley has been used by her and her family, but due to the change from the city with bulk trash pickup, it has not been used as much. So what you'll hear from the opposition is that this is an in incredibly important access point for the property that needs to be preserved. Over the last few months, we've tried to work with the property owners to preserve that access point, to design something that works for everybody. But in fact, we're down to the fact that we have a future developer coming in, trying to redevelop the property and trying to design a new access point. And we couldn't come to terms in terms of how that would work out. Let me walk you through a couple other exhibits. This was on the, on the uh, screen earlier, but clearly, if you look at the exhibits, this is what exists there today. This is not a property that has been maintained as a ongoing access point. Ms. Fielder, the property owner has indicated in testimony on the record that it was used as bulk, tra bulk trash from time to time. Jerry, uh, the property owner who's lived there for 18 years has indicated that they've seen bulk trash being uh, thrown over the fence, uh, mostly tree trimmings over the years, but the city has has now abandoned the practice of picking up trash there. So there is almost next to no public need uh, for that access point. It's been mentioned, even quoted by the uh, opposition, Ms. Fielder calls it an alley. Staff calls it an alley. For all intents and purposes, this has been only used as an alley. To keep that open will cause uh, considerable uh, traffic issues with the new development. It'll cause considerable um, trash dumping to continue to go on until that redevelopment happens. And there's really no guarantee that redevelopment happens. So this comes down to a longtime resident for 18 years with a young family concerned about safety and dumping versus a potential future developer who might be able to split the lots and build a number of new homes and put traffic through this neighborhood. Or if Mr. Graff is correct, the land right of the existing 80 year old lady who uses this particular driveway all the time. So there has been raised a, two, a Prop 207 claim. We do not believe that there's merits in a Prop 207 claim. If this was their main access point, which it's not, if there was any evidence at all or testimony in the record that this is being used frequently and that without this access point, that somehow their access would be restricted then we would have a different story. But in this case, Bethany Home is their main access point, has been the main access point for 50 years. That's where bulk trash is now being picked up. So therefore, we do not believe in any sort of Prop 207 claim. We ask the council to move forward. There are 36 other residents in the neighborhood who have signed letters of support and submitted those letters uh, to the city. Um, so it comes down to um, a young family, 36 other neighbors, or a potential redevelopment of the property um, into new homes. So with that, Mayor, Council Members, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Do any Council Members have questions for Mr. Lally right now? We can obviously return to him when we've heard both PowerPoints as well. All right, seeing no questions, we will then turn to Mr. Graff. <clears throat> Thank you. I believe I've been unmuted. Uh, Mayor and council members, are you able to hear me? We are able to hear you. Wonderful. Um, I do not yet see my ability to share my screen, but I also have a presentation if that's the more convenient way to go about doing it. Wonderful. I am seeing the sharing option. And we can see your presentation. To... Wonderful. Love it when a plan comes together. Mayor, members of the council, um, my name is Ben Graff with the law firm of Quarles and Brady at 2 North Central Avenue, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I am here today representing Marianne Fielder. Um, I, I want to start um, 
first by thanking the council for this opportunity to hold a hearing like this, especially Mrs. Fielder, who would not uh, be able to attend a hearing in light of COVID-19, and, and she is here today on the phone. So thank you for making this accessible. Um, and, and on that note, I, I wanted to make something abundantly clear. This is my client. This is Mary Ann Fielder. Um, as uh, Mr. Lally pointed out, she is 80. Uh, she is a widow. And while we are uh, happy that she has had a neighbor for 18 years of the status of Mr. Mansoor, uh, Mrs. Fielder has been on this property for 50 years, uh, raising her family. Um, I need to make it abundantly clear, I am not here representing a developer or developer's interest. Um, Mary Ann is my client and who I've been working with for months on this uh, exact issue. Um, so moving that forward with that understanding, um, as we've stated, we have no objection to the area in yellow, the subject alleyway, but the 14th Street uh, extension is uh, very, very important. Um, we will talk about what it has been used for, but at the end of the day, it is a secondary access point to my client's current property. And that's really the most important thing to understand. The inherent property right is that this 1.5 acre site, which has been here uh, platted in this manner and lived by this uh, individual since 1971 uh, has always had two access points. Uh, and Mr. Mansoor, who has gone about this abandonment, um, it will be noted in my presentation how not only do I believe the council should rule in our favor and uphold the hearing officer's decision because it's the right thing to do to protect this property right, but I also believe there are legal concerns about the inadequacy of the application and the petition. I can skip through these for the sake of time. Uh, the, the site is located in an R16 district, um, and it's important to note that there are two items at play here. It's not just one long L piece. There is an alley and there is a 14th street extension right away, and they are treated differently and they have different importance. A 14th street actually provides access and future access, whereas an alley only provides some services through the city of Phoenix. Our client, as I have stated, has lived here since 1971. The unfortunate aspect of this is you could ask, how did we get here? How could it be possible that Mrs. Fielder was not provided notice and wasn't a part of this application, even though she's the only property owner that abuts this exact site other than Mr. Mansoor. We do have a gentleman uh, that uh, lives directly north that abuts this portion, but the two property owners that abut this site are my client and Mr. Mansoor. Well, we only became aware of the application when, ironically, Mrs. Fielder was taking in a delivery through her secondary access, someone that needed to access her backyard. She stepped out on May 6th and found the uh, sign for the abandonment hearing prompted herself to get an attorney, and I was assisting her on the next day. Had she missed that sign, we would have missed the opportunity to take part in any discussion at all. It's also very important that your own staff, your abandonment hearing officer, denied the request to abandon 14th Street on June 4th, 2020, because of the opposition and the harm that we provided evidence of to Mrs. Fielder. So the ask before you by Mr. Lally today is to go against your own hearing officer's recommendation. It's very key to understand from a legal aspect that we again believe that there is a legal problem with the application itself. The applicant did not properly notify 100% of adjacent property owners when there are fewer than four property owners abutting a street. In this case, there are only three. It is, that, it is this reason that the petition is incomplete. And let me, let me just be very clear about this. If you take a look at this, you'll notice that the petition in front of us here today that led to what was deemed as a complete application was missing the description of what was being abandoned. If this petition was argued against in court, it would fail 100% of the time. I also want to point out that the abandonment requirement itself requires 100% of the property owners for a street right of way to be not only reached out to, not knocked on the door, but notified. And 100% of the property owners must sign the petition. Well, here we are again. We have the 14th street right of way. 
we have Mrs. Fielder and Jerry Monsoor, and 100% neither signed the petition nor were notified. But even if you decide to ignore what I believe is a significant legal issue that should have presented a point where city staff should not have even pursued or allowed the application to move forward, we have an inherent property right. We have someone that has the right to appeal to their city council and state that if this abandonment goes through, a secondary access point to a 1.6 acre property will go away. And it is true that there is a potential buyer for this site, but that's not the point. The point is that the value of the underlying property, which is Mrs. Fielder's retirement savings, the value of her site will be significantly reduced if there is only one access point. And that's not a greedy contention, that's a property right. That is an issue before the council today that this action would take away a significant amount of property value because a 1.6 acre site should have two clearly delineated accessible points. I'm going to go ahead and stop for now because I want you to be able to hear from Mrs. Fielder and her son, Craig. So I will reserve the rest of my time for them. We will be taking comment cards from them and they have each filled out a card. So if you, they will each get two minutes. Okay, we will then um, open the public hearing and begin with public comment. I'm going to uh, start with the applicant, Jerry Mansour, and then go to Mrs. Fielder. So, um, Jerry, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mary, Mayor and council members. Um, just want to start off by saying uh, my wife and I, Jessica Cisneros Mansour, has been living on this property with our two young children, 13 and 11. My wife is a veteran emergency room nurse at Johnson Lincoln Hospital. Um, as many of you know that these cases of my neighbors and I feel that the alley has been an attractive nuisance for burglaries, transients, vandalism, and illegal dumpings. I've obtained support and signatures from most of the affected neighbors and tried to communicate with all, the, all of them. Specifically, I am appealing the hearing of Chris DePero's decision not to include the right-of-way of abandonment of 14th Street. The decision should include both the alley and the right-of-way east of my property. I think both of the alley and the right-of-way should be considered together. One doesn't work without the other. If the right-of-way is not abandoned, then the same neighborhood problems will persist. They will be just as accessible to vandals, transients, and other undesirables with a permanent closure. Closure of both of the alley and the right-of-way is the most desirable and permanent solution for the neighborhood. Therefore, I ask that both the right-of-way and the alley on 14th Street north of Palo Verde Drive will be abandoned. Closing one side of the alley, the 13th Street entrance, but not closing the unused right-of-way on the 14th Street would ignore 70 years of history and would not achieve the security and safety goals for the residents along Palo Verde and 14th Street. As I have argued, 14th Street North Palo Verde has never been used as a connector to the Bethany home ever. It is really technically an alley. Mrs. Fielder's residence on Bethany Home Road has never used the right of way as an entrance or exit to her home ever. The right of way is off her backyard. Mrs. Fielder has never used that right of way for any reason other to throw dumping of old trash. The stipulation of closing one side of the alley, 13th place entrance, but not closing off the unused for 70 years, quotable by Alan Hilty of Seven City of Phoenix Streets Transportation, is still not achieving a complete closure of both ends to secure the safety for all. Mrs. Fielder's attorney, ben, Mr. Bengraff, suggests that Mrs. Fielder wants to sell this property in the future. In my opinion, that is merely a last minute speculation. It used it used not affect this, it should not affect this decision and should not have been even raised in this hearing. If some buyer in the future backs out, then we are left with an unsecured, unused right away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your testimony. We will next go to Mrs. Fielder, followed by Jay Sward.
Mayor, we are unmuting Mr. Graff to see if he is with Mrs. Fielder. Thank you. Let me check with my client to see if her son has been able to bring her online. Okay, is that Craig? We can put Craig Fielder as unmuted. Yeah, go. Yeah, that's great. Please allow Craig. Thank you. Thank you. And yes. um, Craig, uh, you have two minutes. Uh, your mother has two minutes, but we cannot. We're not allowing borrowed time. So okay. if you could just clarify who's who is speaking, and if we could have a break between the two, that would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. This is Craig Fielder. Thank you very much, council members. Just again, just reiterating, uh, my mom is on the property for over 50 years um, and, and she has had access to that for various reasons, irrigation, uh, pr pruning trees, et cetera. So it just seems like obviously she has the most to lose from this. She has the most square footage abutting that alley. Um, and, and she has had developers over the years come to her and ask um, for an opportunity to develop that land. She has declined over the years, but um, there are developer and there is a developer that really would like access to that rear property. Um, so it is a, a very valuable entry point. And I know they were asking for 1200 square feet. Um, so we've, we've been trying to work some kind of compromise uh, with that, but again, I just think this is for for 50 plus years of having that property and finally wanting to potentially uh, monetize. It just seems that um, this is a property rights and a, a issue and a value issue for that property. Thank you. And we have three speaker cards for members of the Fielder family. Uh, will you all be speaking? I think my mom just wants to speak for a brief okay. moment. And is um, okay. So I think we will then go to uh, Mr. Swart, and then we will come back to you. Are you on this? Are you physically with your mother? So this is the right line to unmute. No, I'm. I'm this, I am not physically with my mother. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. That just helps us manage the phone lines. So we will go to Mr. Swart, and then we will go to Mrs. Fielder. Mayor, we do not have uh, Mr. Swart at this time. Thank you. Then we will go uh, to Mrs. Fielder, followed by Dan Miller. Hello? Hello, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, this is Kim Fielder, um, her daughter speaking for her. So thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, she wanted me to read a statement for her, please. Um, please do. And I would just like to uh, clarify, she has lived in this house for 52 years since 1968. Uh, this is her statement. I am 80 years old and I've lived at this property for 52 years. I raised my family here with a lot of great memories. I found out about the abandonment by accident. Mr. Mansoor said he knocked on my door twice to inform me of his intentions. However, I was either not at home or did not hear his knock. If he really wanted to inform me about what was going on, it would, he would have left a note with a phone number for contact. I feel strongly that there was deception on his part. Throughout the years, we have used the 14th Street access for bulk trash due to the large size of the property. I would like to add here personally, we were never informed to put bulk trash on Bethany home ever. And we have continued to use that site as bulk trash up till about February before COVID hit um, without her allowing the people into her home at this point. So I will continue her statement. Uh, after my husband passed away, it has taken me several years to decide to sell the property. Having made the decision in June of 2019, which coincided with the timing Monsoor started the legwork for this abandonment, I do not think this is a coincidence. The loss of this street access may impact my property 
value. It appears that Mr. Mansoor wants to increase his property value at the expense of mine. Thank you for your time. That is the end of her statement. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we will next go to Mr. Miller, and then I believe we have found Mr. Schwartz. So after Mr. Miller, we will go to Mr. Schwartz. There you go. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. My name is Dan Miller, and I am the owner of the property located at 1399 East Bethany Home Road. There is a 30-foot strip along my southern boundary line at the southeast corner that is adjacent, adjacent to the 14th Street right-of-way in question. So mine is the third property directly affected by this, and I'm the next-door neighbor to the fielders. Um, I urge the council to approve the abandonment, abandonment request. I submit there's no benefit to the public in maintaining the right-of-way. In fact, it serves no public function. The alley and the 14th Street right-of-way have always functioned together as an alley. Abandoning one without the other is inconsistent with its historical use and frankly makes no sense. Keeping 14th Street as a right-of-way only benefits one property owner 1415 East Bethany Home Road. Importantly, keeping the 14th Street right of way would have future consequences that need to be carefully considered. Particularly upon the redevelopment of the area, city code would require 14th Street to connect to Bethany Home Road. This would punch through both 1399 and 1415 East Bethany Home Road parcels. No one has asked for roadway connection there, and it, it's our opinion that no reasonable person would request one. The increased traffic would significantly impact neighborhood safety and result in decreased property values for everyone along 14th Street. It would waste a significant amount of public and private resources, time and money, to relocate public infrastructure, specifically an SRP irrigation facility at the northeast corner of 1399 East Bethany. Relocation of that facility is a tremendous cost and re relocating would have no benefit to anyone. Property values would decrease for everyone along Bethany Home due to the dedication of private property for a public street. For granting the abandonment request provides a clear path for the right of way to be removed, eliminating a considerable amount of uncertainty for the benefit of the neighborhood. The land would ultimately be consolidated under the appellant's ownership and maintenance, which would ultimately be of benefit to all stakeholders. Thank you. Our next comment will be from Mr. Swart. Can you hear me, Mayor? We can now hear you, yes. Thank you. I was actually speaking. I just, for some reason, couldn't get through it. Thank you very much for your time. Council members, thank you for your time. Jay Swart, 4438 North 47th Place. I uh, have known Jerry and his family for over 20 years. Jerry is one of the co-owners of Lucy's Marketplace and The Orchard. Of course, all of you are aware of the tremendous impact the restaurant industry has had. Uh, he also mentioned that his wife is a 17-year veteran nurse. Uh, we're not going to put up any pictures of his kids holding hands with backpacks or anything, but we're here really to talk about the, the issue at hand. Um, Jerry was first in to uh, put the application in. I'm, you know, I feel bad Mrs. Fielder didn't get notification, but what I really want to talk about is the facts and the truth of this case. There's a gentleman by the name of John Hansen who has already filed a plan review for this exact address. So the real truth is this property is more than likely an escrow and going to be sold to a developer who will probably put eight to 10 houses on there. Um, there is no impact. Uh, Mrs. Fielder will, will have the, the, the property. I believe uh, Lloyd Fox is the realtor. And so this property is underway to be developed. Um, the real issue is, uh, I think the critical part is that, that Jerry had his application in first. Um, he has a plan for the property. Um, he's lived there 18 years. He has two small children, as you've heard testimony. And I believe and hope that the council will vote in his favor uh, today uh, when this case is completed. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is our final public comment. So I will close the public hearing. Uh, this item is in Council District 6, so I will turn first to Councilman DeCicio. Oh, thank you, Mayor, and I appreciate it. And you know, this these these this case has been going on for some time now. We've continued the case. We try to get people to work on it. 
to mediate it, to do the whole thing. There's been an incredible amount of work. But at the end of the day, it always comes down to you just sometimes just got to make a decision. And that decision means you've got to move forward. You're almost every zoning case that we've had lately, for whatever reason, we've had claims of 207 on it. And, you know, the, the case, the courts will always look at it. And there's always that threat out there, but who knows if it ever, and we haven't had anybody really follow through. So my motion, Mayor, is just to make a decision on this case and move it forward, and then people can make their own decisions of where they want to go. My motion is going to be to move uh, to approve item 38 and uphold the hearing officer's approval of the request, but with the following modification in addition to the stipulation. Deletion of stipulation six, which restricts the abandonment of any portion of 14th Street. And that's my motion, Mayor. Second. Can I, can I, Mayor, can I ask a question? Uh, uh, please, and just for the record, we had a motion from Councilman DeCicio and a second from, was that Councilwoman Pastor? Vice Mayor. Vice Mayor, okay. Um, so we will turn first to uh, Councilwoman Stark and then I believe Councilwoman Pastor had a comment, so I will go next to her. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, I thought the hearing officer's decision, um, Councilman DeCicio, was just to approve the alley portion. Did I? So when you made your motion, were you meaning to approve both 14th um, Street and the alley? I'm sorry. It was just basically to, you know, it was to go forward to the hearing officer's approval of the request. And then uh, the deletion of stipulation six, which was in there, which restricted the abandonment. Okay, I just wanted to get clarification on that. And then I just had a quick question um, for Alan. The uh, plat that you put up during your presentation, is that indeed in for review, site plan review, uh, uh, plat ma review? <laughs> Mayor uh, and uh, Councilwoman Stark, yes, uh, that uh, site plan has been submitted for a pre-app uh, for that property. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Pastor, did you have any comments or questions? Yes, I do. Um, I received, I think, uh, I received an email from uh, Bill Lowley, and I think there was 35 um, signatures or 34 letters in support. Uh, my question is, did the applicant or the um, bin graph receive any of that information? Mayor, uh, uh, Councilman Pastor, uh, the applicant uh, did provide some stuff uh, late this morning. I don't know if it went to Mr. Graff or not. Uh, but it was not uh, submitted uh, until uh, later sometime this morning. Uh, I know that it went to you guys beforehand because I had heard about it from uh, one of the council members, but it had never been submitted to staff. Okay. And then my second question is, uh, I'm just curious of why both parties could not come to an agreement. So I don't know if it's both the lawyers that answer this or who answers, but... Uh, I would like to know why they couldn't come to an agreement on this piece. Mayor Councilman Pastor, I would recommend that each uh, you know side provide a kind of one sentence response to that so that they can the council can understand from their perspective. So it would be Mr. Graf so why don't we and then Mr. Lally. So we will then open up Mr. Graff's line for comment. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor and uh, Councilman Pastor. Um, no, it's it's a pertinent question because what's what's been absent from this hearing is the dis, the behind discussion of what has occurred between the parties, um, and it speaks to those supposed opposition petition letters that came in this morning, which no, our um, side has not received a copy of. And I, I would like to know more about what the neighbors were told. And, and the reason is, and it speaks to the negotiation, is the reason that negotiations have fallen apart only in the last week 
is because we have not been able to provide a large enough number to compensate Jerry Mansoor for the alley that he wants to sell back to our client. And I think that that's an important comment. Um, if the 36 neighbors signed a letter in support of preventing access, well, I have concerns about that because Jerry Mansoor is in the process of trying to sell us that access. Um, and I don't, I, I don't know what to say about that. I haven't seen it. Um, but the, the main issue here is um, under the calculations of the City of Phoenix abandonment statute or ordinance, um, Mr. Mansoor will be able to purchase this portion of the 14th Street for approximately $804 from the city. Um, according to Bill Alley's uh, correspondence and the market rate that he expects, um, they've labeled the value that they would sell the alley at $70,000. I think that's an important item for the council to consider. Thank you for the question. Thank you. And now we will turn to Mr. Lally. Thank you, Mayor and council members. I'll try to be brief. Um, so quickly, uh, the, the breakdown in uh, negotiations we've met three or four times, or at least talked three or four times has come down to splitting of the cost of not only the land cost from the city, but recouping the improvement costs, trying to figure out who's gonna pay for what and when. We have a landowner uh, who is ready to go with the improvement costs. Uh, and we have somebody who does not have a lot of means who's ready to sell to a developer. So our biggest concern is who's going to help pay for the improvement costs. Um, so it came down to money. Yes, it comes down to who, how are we going to split up the cost of improving this access point, gating it and making it safe for all parties. Uh, the last comment by Mr. Graff that I put a number of 70,000 plus on it is just absolutely untrue. We've asked for a reasonable accommodation for market rate. Mr. Graff provided me a breakdown of what he thought the market rate for the land would be based on the sales price that he's getting from his landowner, he targeted it at about $25,000 is the market rate of the land that he's expecting us to give to him. So uh, I don't know where the 72 grand came from, but all we're looking for is uh, accommodation for uh, all of the hard effort, money, expenses that Jerry has put forth for the better part of a year um, to be helped and recouped we're at a breakdown um, in those negotiations as of yesterday. We had all of these letters of support ready to go last week. I held all of the letters of support to continue to try to negotiate a price, see if we weren't gonna be here today battling it out. Um, the letters were dropped today, but they were signed last week. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilwoman Pastor, any additional comments or questions? No, I, I just um, I just find this whole case interesting. That's all. Any additional council member comments or questions? Roll call. Decisio. Yes. Garcia. Garcia. Yes. Thank you. Nowakowski. Yes. Castor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. No. Oh. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 8-1. We next move to the northeast corner of Central Avenue and Happy Valley Road. Uh, we have two related cases, I, um, item 39 and 40. We will begin both with a staff report, then we will open a public hearing. Um, 
both this applicant and the opposition will have 10 minutes each, and then we will go two minutes each to everyone who has filled out a comment card, and then we will close the public hearing. So uh, we will pass it back to our planning and development Mayor? director, Alan Stevenson. Oh, Mayor? Yes. Yes. Oh, I may have a potential conflict on this, so I will not be engaging at all in this case. Wonderful. If the clerk could note that Councilman DeCicio will not be participating. Yes, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman. We'll turn it to our Planning and Development Director, Ellen Stevenson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor, members of Council, uh, as stated, item 39 and 40 are companion cases. Item 39 is a general plan amendment. Uh, and item 40 is the corresponding rezoning case. The parcel is located at the northeast corner of Central Avenue and Happy Valley Road. You see it outlined uh, here in, uh, in green color. Uh, it is approximately 156 acres. Uh, the general plan amendment request for item 39 is uh, preserves uh, and residential uh, zero to two, parks open space, future one dwelling unit per acre and Commerce Park Business Park designation to a residential two to three and a half and three and a half to five dwelling units per acre, as well as a Commerce Park uh, Business Park designation. Staff does recommend approval of the general plan. This is the current land use designation, uh, and this is the proposed land use designation with the uh, residential and the Commerce Park uh, going through from the Happy Valley Road and Central Intersection up through the site. Um, with that, I'll move to the zoning case. The zoning case is uh, from S1, uh, which is about one acre lots to a planned unit development. PUD staff does recommend approval. Uh, per the memo uh, from myself uh, from September 1st, 2020, with additional stipulations that we'll talk about in, uh, in just a few minutes. There's the subject site uh, again. And this is the conceptual site plan layout, uh, as you see here. That's based upon the revised uh, memo and site plan that came out uh, on September 1st. And so you see the, the residential area up here uh, to the north of the site. That's the area where, principally where the neighbors have concerns about some of the density that's proposed there, in addition to some of the other concerns that you'll hear about from them uh, in a few minutes. Uh, the proposed uh, the memo that came out has the additional stipulations uh, that look at making some accommodations to address some of the neighborhood concerns along that yearly ro yearling road property line, which is the north property line, uh, where they're reducing the number of lots. They're expanding them to 60 foot wide minimum lots. Uh, they've dropped the overall uh, density down to, to 237 with this latest site plan, uh, which does, did come down from uh, 300 when the application initially started. They are proposing other uh, items as part of this uh, memo uh, to address some of the neighborhood concerns. Uh, one of those uh, additional items is proposing to put in a uh, fire hydrant further up Central Avenue, uh, close to the Yearling property line road, so that way there would be uh, the additional ability for, uh, in the event of emergency, to have a, a fire line uh, connected into that fire hydrant as well. Uh, and with that, uh, staff is happy to answer any questions, although I would just note for the record, it was approved by the Planning Commission uh, and the Deer Valley Village Planning Committee. Thank you. Do we have any uh, questions for our staff before we open the public hearing? Yeah, Mayor, really quick. Um, Alan, do you have the exact uh, vote of the village and the exact vote of the Planning Commission? Thank you. Thank you. I do, uh, Mayor, members of uh, Council. The uh, general plan amendment was approved by the Deer Valley Village Planning Committee 11 to 1. Uh, the corresponding uh, zoning case uh, by the village was also 11 to 1 and the Planning Commission uh, vote on August 6 uh, was uh, approved six to one uh, in both counts. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. We will now open the public hearing. We will begin with a 10 minute presentation or up to 10 minute presentation from the applicant and then we will turn uh, to Robert Hansen and Patty Trites for a, a 10 minute presentation, up, up to 10 minute presentation. So, uh, Dave, 
Krzyzewski, on behalf of the applicant, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. David Krzyzewski, on behalf of PAF Central, the property owner. Let me see if I can uh, start my screen share here. Can everyone see that uh, PowerPoint presentation? No, I see you. Okay. <laughs> Let me see what we can do here. Share. There we go. Technology is a wonderful thing when it works. All right, now we've got it. At least Great. for my Thank computer. you. Everyone still see that? Yes, we do. Okay, great, thank you. Again, as Alan pointed out, uh, we're here for the 156 acre site uh, at the northeast corner of Happy Valley and Central. Again, while Alan did a great job explaining kind of this, I wanna set with these first few slides a context of the area, because that, that's really a material issue here uh, of concern from all parties. As you can see here, we've highlighted the property. To the immediate north and northwest, you see some various county parcels uh, that have existed like that for a long time. But then as you move further to the west and to the north, you'll note that those other areas are, are City of Phoenix properties and have been well developed uh, with uh, various residential developments. Further to the west, you have the Union Park development. And even to the south, as you move toward Deer Valley Airport, uh, both residential, higher density residential, multifamily, and commercial properties. Again, here, just a, a slide depicting the various land uses around the property itself. As Alan mentioned, the property is currently zoned S1. Uh, this has been a, a topic of discussion throughout this case in that, uh, as staff has noted, S1 is really a holding category. It's really not intended uh, for future development, but it was assigned that zoning district and category when, it, when the property was annexed in uh, from the county many years ago. Again, as Alan pointed out in the general plan, on the, on the left, you'll see the current general plan designation, and on the graphic on the right, what we are proposing. And I want, do want to point out here, part of what we believe the value of the development is, again, a planned uh, unit for this overall project, reducing the gray area, which is Industrial Commerce Park, from its current 87 acres to about 57 acres, and then also providing for detailed design and development criteria for the single-family residential to the north, and then a medium density residential to the southeast portion of the site. Again, in terms of context, you'll see the property. Uh, the RU43 are the various county uh, residents and county lots. And then the balance of the developments here, again, for character and context, are other developments within the city of Phoenix that have been planned and developed over the years. You'll notice the lot sizes for each of those, as well as the various zoning districts. And again, I'd point out for comparison here, while you see R2, R18, R110 throughout. What, what we are proposing here is an R110 comparable zoning district with lots from 5,100 to 6,900 square feet. So again, I hope this paints a bit of a context for the area. In terms of environmental, you're all familiar with the site, has a long environmental history. Uh, representatives of ADQ are on the phone to answer any specific questions you may have. But suffice it to say that the environmental nature of the site has been fully characterized. The areas being proposed for residential use have been cleared by ADQ, uh, my client, uh, and the area for non-residential use was the area of former impact and will be used for commercial purposes only. Uh, very quickly on community outreach, uh, this project has been ongoing now for over 18 months. There has been significant community outreach on this, nine community meetings of various types. Uh, we have over noticed uh, adjoining property owners to ensure involvement in this property. The result of that outreach has really been uh, 29 letters of support in your packet, letters of support from both the North Phoenix Chamber of Commerce, the school district, and numerous speakers at prior public hearings supporting the project. As Alan mentioned early on, their original site plan featured about 300 lots. Uh, smaller lots with a higher density. By context, the current plan that's in front of you today has featured significant differences and changes really being responsive to comments from the county residents over that 18 month time frame. Changes include a mixture of larger lots, 60 foot wide lots, a reduction in density, particularly along the north boundary line closest to the county residents to near two dwelling units per acre, 
We've reduced the number of lots along Yearling Road, which is the, again, the dividing line between city property and county property uh, to only 18 lots. Originally, we were at 40. We have built in a huge landscape buffer along that northern boundary line that averages 159 feet of landscape buffer with a minimum of 61. So looking at that in context, that's over nine acres of just landscape buffer area uh, in that area. And again, we provide a overall landscape area open space of about 30%. In terms of infrastructure, one of the values other than adding uh, the additional housing and diversity in this area is really the infrastructure. Uh, the developer will be putting in public infrastructure that will be privately funded. Uh, this includes miles of new uh, water main and sewer line. You can see the graphic here, bringing those utilities from near 15th Avenue uh, eastward all the way north on Central Avenue and to the uh, eastern extent of the property. Again, these are public improvements that will be privately funded, millions of dollars of value uh, that developer is, is doing that the city will seek value from. In addition to that, there are significant impact fees that will be assessed on this. And so this project, while it adds the value of diversity and new housing stock to the area and redevelopment, it also provides utilities not only for this property, but for the other properties in the area for future development and even the county residents should they decide to avail themselves uh, through an annexation property to utilize this. These improvements also include significant road improvements, a traffic signal, and as Alan mentioned, a new fire hydrant. Again, just to address some of the issues you'll hear in terms of concerns, the density and comments, a depiction of our original plan to our current plan. You'll notice the variation of lots, significant increase in landscape buffer, and again, a reduction of lots, most importantly along Yearling, where we're now at 18 lots backing up to Yearling with 16 county properties to the immediate north. Again, an illustration of the increased buffer, as I mentioned, it is significant along that northern boundary, trying to be responsive to specific comments from the county residents. Drainage has been an ongoing discussion. We've provided for you and to staff a uh, preliminary report of drainage from our engineer detailing uh, the drainage that affects the property and how the site plan has been designed to adequately accommodate that drainage without any effects on adjoining properties. Again, traffic, you'll hear a discussion. Uh, long ago, back in March of this year, we did receive approval from the city on a full traffic study based on the plan, based on the access drives that are provided on the Central and Happy Valley, uh, and that has been fully approved. What you'll see on the next two slides is, is really a laundry list of changes that have occurred, again, over this long 18-month process. I won't read all these, but I will highlight again significant reduction in density of the, the residential lots to the north by over 21%. We've increased the landscape buffer along the county residence to a minimum of 60 feet with an average of over 129 feet of landscape. We have 30% open space throughout the property. Again, we've worked very hard with ADEQ and the city to resolve all these environmental impacts that previously impacted the property as well. Again, in summary, what we bring before you today is really the culmination of 18 months or more of work with city staff, with the county residents, more than nine community meetings on this, and even most recently is the last two weeks, uh, we've had both in-person meetings and virtual meetings to discuss additional plan changes. We've made some of those changes and to be accommodating. The PUD document that is in front of you uh, is long, as you all see from your thick binders, and is extremely detailed because it is a complex property and we've worked very hard with staff to design development and design criteria that is tailored to the property, which is the underlying nature of a PUD. Again, the project provides extensive improvements that'll benefit not only the property, but the surrounding area. And as noted before, again, we bring this forward to you with strong support from local businesses, landowners, the school district and the chamber. Uh, as Alan mentioned, uh, this was approved by uh, the Deer Valley Village Planning Committee by a vote of 11 to one and by planning commission by a vote of six to one. And so again, the plan before you today, we believe is really a culmination of many, many hours and weeks and months of work, uh, cooperative work on behalf of my client uh, with the direction of city staff, uh, with input from the community and I think staff 
staff report goes into great detail summing up how this plan uh, meets the criteria for the general plan, meets the criteria uh, for the PUD, and very aptly fits into the nature and character of the area. And as you see there at the top is a, a quote from the staff report. And again, I would suggest to you that the project is highly compatible uh, with this area, the other developments that we noted earlier. It brings a new and greater diversity of housing to the community, new infrastructure improvements that benefit all the residents, not only the city residents, but the county residents as well. And we believe this will be a great long-term benefit uh, to the city. With that, uh, we would certainly request your approval and affirmation of the prior approvals from the village and planning commission. And I would be glad to answer any questions you may have. Mayor. Yes, uh, Vice Mayor. Vice. Yes. Dave, I, I just had a quick question for you or, or just, so just really quick, can you just recap from a city benefit perspective, any infrastructure being provided? Certainly. So we are bringing a six, sorry, turn off my timer. Um, we are providing a 16 inch water line, which originates near 15th Avenue, moving all the way eastward to the intersection, northward on Central, and then further eastward to the eastern extent of the property. We're bringing in a 12-inch public sewer line from around 7th Avenue, uh, again, to the same limits to, to the extent of the intersection, northward and further eastward. We'll be providing full improvements on Central Avenue from Happy Valley Road northward, which includes two new lanes of pavement, curb gutter, sidewalk, and multi-use trail and, and landscaping. We are fully funding as part of phase one of this project, which is the residential you see in front of you, a new traffic signal at the intersection, as well as future dedication of right of way on Happy Valley Road and future improvements to Happy Valley Road uh, as part of the city's overall capital improvement project for that roadway. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Uh, for our second presentation, we will begin with Robert Hansen. And Robert, if you could signal to staff when uh, we are ready to uh, turn to uh, Patty Trites, that would be very helpful. Uh, we will leave the distribution of the 10 minutes to you. So when you are done, you can turn to Patty. Okay, are you ready to go? Yes. Okay. Do you have the presentation uh, that we've uh, sent in the PowerPoint? I do not see it on my screen. So, staff, are we doing screen sharing, or are we gonna the staff gonna put it up on the? Mayor, members of council, we are doing uh, screen sharing. So uh, they will give him the the presenter rights to to do the presentation. Mr. Hansen, if, if you don't have it handy, because I know you're, you're a last minute uh, change from uh, Heather, who was the spokesperson, we do have it if you prefer that, that we run it from here. If you could run it from there, we'd really appreciate it, sir. Thank okay. you. Sir, just give us one second, we'll, uh, we'll get it up here for you. Thank you.
Okay, well, thank you very much. I want to uh, thank the mayor and the council members for letting the central foothills concerned citizens present our opposition to approving this proposed development. My name is Robert Hansen. And I reside at 508 East Yearling Road, directly north of the proposed development. Over the last 18 months, we've worked with the developer on this project to come to an acceptable development. We have not been able to do that. We have a number of concerns that we have feel that have not been addressed properly. It starts with the contamination of the site, the density, traffic, and the drainage flow of the site. We feel these issues need to be addressed further with our community input before this proposal can be presented to you for approval. Next slide, please. The PUD regulatory framework is too broad for this development, specifically parcels two and three. PUD supersedes replace all applicable zoning requirements. And so if such details are provided for parcel two and three, they shall be removed from this request. Parcel two proposes a multi-story building with a height of 56 feet. This parcel is encumbered with two doors that will not be removed from this parcel for quite some time. One is to protect five capped areas over contaminated soil that cannot be removed. Contamination goes down 160 feet. Until a clear plan is developed identifying uses, traffic, public safety, and density, this parcel should be eliminated from the request. Parcel three also uh, is proposing a three-story building, 40 foot tall. 60% of the site is greater than the 10% maximum slope with a large portion of that site being between 20 to 40% slope. This parcel should not be included at this request at this time. Next slide. Where the zoning occurs adjacent to the Sonoran Preserve is encouraged to develop on the lower levels below 10% slope. Consistent with the general plan to maintain the preservation of the vigil amenity for all citizens. As stated earlier, a majority of parcel three is greater than 10% slope which is shown in green on the slide. Until a conceptual plan is proposed for parcel two and three, we should exclude these. The city must adhere strictly to the hillside ordinances, including no development over 10% slope line and must adhere strictly to the edge guidelines as stated by the Phoenix Mountain Preserve Council. Next slide. One of our major concerns has been density, the size of the lots. We feel that the current plan still is not compatible with the surrounding development. And we have repeatedly supported the planning department's recommendation of a zoning mix of R118, R110. We've gotten closer through working with the developer, but still feel there more work needs to be done. The top picture is one of our houses compared to the bottom picture, which is a typical R110 neighborhood. Uh, attached to our uh, revised or proposed stipulations, there is a revised site plan attached. Next slide, please. All, another major concern is traffic that will be generated by the development. Our community consists roughly of 160 homes with lots for another 100 homes. We have only two ways in and out of our community, Central Avenue and Fifth Avenue. We have received traffic counts from the county on Central, the city of Phoenix on Happy Valley. Central Avenue currently count has a count of 700 cars a day coming and going. Happy Valley has an hourly total of approximately 2,000 cars per hour at rush hour. Now we're adding another 237 homes. The Village Planning Committee Vice Chair, Teresa DeLeo, stated at the May 20th review that traffic is her biggest concern. She strongly urged that a streetlight be installed at Central and Happy Valley and a secondary way to access from parcel one through parcel two to Happy Valley. The stipulation has been added for the street light and the planning commission in their memo stated the light was to go in at the time of parcel one development. We understand traffic department doesn't agree with that. Uh, and we, you know, please, uh, we need this light in now. As far as the secondary access, the developer just keeps saying, no, that this is not possible. Next slide, please. Our last major concern has been the drainage and uh, the need for an updated analysis. The developers presented us a preliminary analysis on August 28th, which confirmed the CF, the cubic feet per second flow that will occur on the property 
from the runoff on the north and east. All the channels along Yearling Road, which there's six of them, I believe, will be directed into a drainage way, then goes west to one large channel that goes into the development. As you can see, that flow at the northmost point along Yearling Road will be 432 cubic feet per second, based on a 100-year storm. There is also a significant flow over one of the caps. The top picture of the slide shows the area of the site plan that we have concern with the drainage flow over the rip wrap cap. This rip wrap cap is 641 square feet located 10 to 20 feet from the residential retention area. The flow over this cap is said to be uh, 102 cubic feet per second uh, per this preliminary report. The report also shows that there will be a 55 foot wide erosion setback for this flow that will occur over the cap. The Janey's report as prepared by CBL at this, at this rip rack cap should be reviewed by ADEQ and the engineering firm that designed the cap prior to receiving any approvals. The next slide, please. In summary, as a community, we work with the developer per the directions of the planning committee and councilman Waring. Our interest in every proposed change has been with the focus on community compatibility and public safety, such as the installation of the fire hydrants at the corner of Yearling Road and Central, and another one proposed at 5th Street in Yearling. We have submitted update stipulations that highlight these features and our willingness to, or to cooperate. We request the City of Phoenix consider safety first and the compatibility of this community before rezoning. We recommend not approving as submitted until this is completed. And now, if you could, uh, but Patty, please address her portion. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great, thank you. And can you turn it back one slide before this, Alan? The slide right before this. There you go. We could just leave it on that slide. Um, thank you very much, Mayor and Council um, people. Thank you. My name is Patty Trice. I reside at 2421 West Hayduck Road in Phoenix, Arizona. I believe the request for the general plan amendment and the rezoning of these of this parcel is premature. I want to thank the developer for sending the concerned homeowners, the neighbors, a copy of their preliminary drainage report by CVL last Friday. In this report, CVL states on page one that there is a quote combined peak flow of 640 cubic feet per second impacting the central foothills development. Just for the record, that is three times the, value, the volume of water that flooded me and my neighbors in Southern Hills in 2014. And our lots are approximately 10,000 square feet larger than the lots here proposed. I also want to thank and, and appreciate the, the help from Alan Stevenson and his team in updating some of the stipulations. No one intends to build in harm's way, resulting in a flooded home or a flooded backyard. But there is a safety concern here for the city, for the future homeowners, for the taxpayers. Let's do the right thing from the start, regardless of the community. We are all citizens of Phoenix. I don't want to see another new homeowner flooded. The developer's own preliminary drainage report validates the concern over the flooding potential of this new community. We brought it up at the planning commission hearing and staff advised the planning commission that it was outside of their scope to talk about drainage um, and the request for additional drainage reports to be done. I was not at the Deer Valley Village meeting, so I do not know if the drainage was brought up at that village meeting. But I know we brought discussed it at the planning commission meeting and it was outside their scope. So I request that the city council postpone this request until we have the answers to the following three questions. How does the developer know that the three the, the 237 homes on this plan can safely be put on the property with these water flows? Even their own preliminary reports report showed 640 cubic feet per second. But the preliminary, they don't show the water flow through the lots. Second, does a developer developer commit to taking homes in this plan out of the path of water? This to reduce the density would would also help in the water flows and 
with the neighbor's concern over density. So you could it could be a win win. But do they commit to taking homes out? And on page two of the CVL report, it states the local streets should be designed as such that a hundred year flow does not exceed a hundred cubic feet per second per the table reference in the city of Phoenix's own stormwater policies. How does the developer plan to do this? I know that this is early in the process. I strongly believe the new housing community layout for these new homes is located is premature. Thank you uh, so much for that testimony. Uh, we will now go to public comment. Uh, we will begin with Bill Levy, followed by Cheryl Stevenson. Ah, good afternoon, Mayor Kay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Ah. It's a pleasure to meet you finally. Uh, and city council members, good afternoon. My name is Bill Levy. I live at 525 East Hartford Avenue in Phoenix. I sit on the Deer Valley Village Planning Committee and I enjoyed in reviewing the detailed information supplied by the applicant. The site's history is unique. And first, some of the problems with the pollution caused by the earlier manufacturer had me concerned, but through communication with ADQS and reading on more information, I realized that these caps should be safe. On my first visit to the site, I was horrified by driving up Central Avenue and also the danger of the traffic on 7th Street and Happy Valley. They need to be made safer, which is one of the main points that I think is good for uh, this neighborhood. Um, the other main concern is that meetings that I attended, I spoke to some neighbors and they told me of a, of a depleted aquifer and that some homes still have tainted wells. So some people still are being affected by this pollution. So the opportunity for them to become a annex to the city would be a great help for the neighborhood. Dave Kurchowski, has done a great job of bringing this case forward. And I really think this is an important project for our neighborhood. So I vote strongly yes, that we should continue. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Cheryl will be followed by Kevin Finley. Cheryl, the floor is yours. Thank you. If I could ask that you bring up Mr. Hansen's presentation and leave slide two showing please. While I speak, that would be wonderful, <clears throat> if that's possible. Right there, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I am Sherry Stevenson. I live at 218 East Yearling Road. So I'm located directly north of the proposed PUD and the requested zoning changes. The Central Foothills Concerned Citizens Group requested that you not approve this development as submitted. Specifically, we request a 30 day extension on this agenda item, allowing us to further work with the developer in order to come to an agreement. I'd like to highlight a couple of these main concerns that I have. Density. The proposed density is not consistent with the surrounding area. The largest proposed lots are one tenth the size of my lot directly across the street and then they only graduate smaller from there. By reducing the number of homes, lot sizes could be increased to accommodate our requested density of R118 while also retaining a satisfying buffer. I was raised in Sunburst Farms and learned at an early age to appreciate the elbow room of farm acreage that farm acreage offers. This is also why I moved to East Yearling Road. Again, the zoning changes requested are not, not consistent with neighboring properties, and I ask that you vote against those changes by the applicant. Number two, preserve. Our Sonoran preserve views that surround this property. That's why I referenced slide two here in that picture in the lower left. I ask that you require parcels two and three to be separated from the PUD due to very limiting supported development plans. Before owning property in this neighborhood, I'd often intentionally drive Happy Valley Road eastbound towards 7th Street, like this, these pictures predict here. 
As a Phoenix native, I know many of my friends and family have done the same. And we often chat about, chat about how it's such a relaxing and beautiful drive offering extensive views of the Sonoran Preserve. The way the PUD sits now, this all goes away. The way it stands, the PUD calls for up to 56 foot high buildings, which will completely block these views. I ask that you require parcels two and three be separated from the proposal for further consideration on appropriate use. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Kevin will be followed by Brandon Shipman. Here. Kevin is no longer on the line at this point. Oh, thank you. Uh, Brandon will be followed by Robin Thomas. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Brandon Shipman. My address is 29216 North 20th Lane and Phoenix 85085. Uh, I am a member of the Deer Valley Village. First of all, I just want to say thank you for your time uh, and service to the city. Like you, I'm deeply committed to my community and that requires me to think long and Hard about every case that goes before me. I do my best to plan for long term ben benefit of the area as a whole. Uh, that's why I wholeheartedly support this project, as did my fellow village planning uh, commissioners. A few reasons being it brings a diversity of housing options to an area that desperately need it. Currently, most of the housing stock is older and on much larger lots that many people don't want. Uh, it also supports existing retail in the area. Um, my other village planning committee committee member Michelle Gardner can't be here, but she wanted to speak uh, in support mainly because it, it brings much needed infrastructure to the area at the developer's expense. Um, and the developer will also be improving the roads and putting in a stoplight uh, that will help with the traffic and congestion. Um, this case has been going on for almost 18 months now because it is a PUD. The village was required to hear the case twice. Uh, I've personally watched the progress in the case and, and want to note a few things. The developers community outreach has been significant, uh, though the village or though the neighbors and the developer don't always agree on the outcome. Staff confirmed a number of times at village that the developer has just not not only just met, but also exceeded all procedural requirements. Uh, the developers made considerable compromises along the way that are responsive to the community's concerns. For most of the time that this case was before us, the main issue was environmental. The developer solved all those issues. Uh, the developers also tried to address all community concerns, but those concerns have, have changed considerably over the last nine months, uh, and it's difficult to, to hit a moving target. So I hope that you'll join me and my fellow uh, village planning members and the planning commission in supporting this case. Thank you. Thank you. Robin will be followed by Mark Lewis. Mayor and Council, this is Robin Thomas with the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. I don't have a statement to make. Uh, I just wanted to be available to answer any questions that Council may have about the oversight that ADEQ has provided to this property over the years. Thank you. Okay, um, since we have you online, does ADEQ consider this proposal to be appropriate from an environmental perspective? Uh, you know, we're neutral on the development proposal. Uh, we uh, we have no concerns about uh, the property from an environmental perspective, other than the work that we've already done. Uh, so I, I I don't know that I have any more to add than that. Wonderful. And would you mind staying online in case uh, council members have any questions for you later? Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Uh, we will next go to Mark. Followed by William Verno. Yes, this is Mark. Can you hear me? We can. Excellent. Thank you. Again, Mark Lewis, 320 West Lone Cactus Drive, 85027. I am in support of this case. My family and I have a long history of buying and selling land throughout the valley, over 60 years, in fact. We've been investing in land and commercial properties in the Deer Valley area since the mid 70s. Most recently, one of our partnerships purchased 26 acres at 7th Avenue south of Happy Valley Road, which is just south of the Central Foothills project. I'm also a member of the Deer Valley Village Planning Committee, and I'm here today because my colleagues on the Deer Valley Village and I believe that this project is good for the community. It is my firm belief as a local property owner, this project will increase property values in the area. 
But more importantly, we support it because this type of development is needed in the area. And I believe it is compatible with the surrounding character and context of the Deer Valley Village. If you look in the immediate area, there's a lot of new development that abuts RU-43 County zoning. Immediately to the northwest, Fireside at Norterra, and to the west, Union Park development also abuts RU-43 County zoning. Both of these developments have helped increase the diversity in available housing in the area and have also brought in much needed improvements to existing infrastructure that will benefit the surrounding area long term. The new residents at this proposed development will also supply additional workforce to local industrial and commercial businesses, as well as help support retail in the immediate area, which will help Deer Valley to thrive long term. In summary, I believe this is a great project that brings value to the area by improving existing infrastructure, increasing housing availability and diversity, and increased surrounding property values, which is why it passed with an 11 to 1 vote at Village and a 6 to 1 vote at the Planning Commission. Please take our voices into account when deciding this case. Thank you. Thank you. William will be followed by Ryan Weed. Not now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, my name is Bill Verno. My property butts up right directly with the property that we're talking about. My family have lived here for over 20 years. At one time when we were asked whether or not we knew what was going on on this property with UPCO and their manufacturing, we were very understanding of that because it had public safety issues with it where they were building uh, ejection seats for the military and uh, airbags for the cars. Once we, le once we learned, where we learned about a problem was whenever we started to have our wells tested for contamination. We then learned at that particular point in time that our, our water that we get out of our private wells were contaminated, being contaminated, and that was being tested. And it's still being tested. The problems that we saw then led us to, to believe that there was more issues that needed to be done, and we did a complete history of this property. There has been a lot of timelines and violations that were occurring on that property that we pointed out during all the presentations with the ADEQ people. We realized that ADEQ went through a tremendous amount of research and, and reporting and analysis to determine that portions of this property was contaminated and needed to be taken care of. We are still believing that there is potential for contamination to exist in our wells because they're being tested still now. We would like for this to be continued for at least another 30 days so that we can work with the developer in reducing the, the uh, density, along with the fact that with the new report for the uh, drainage will probably cause a certain amount of reduction in the density. Thank you very much, appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, Ryan is next, followed by Stuart Hammer. I'm sorry, no, uh, let's see, Stuart is not online. Mayor and Council, my name is Ryan Weed. I work with Cohen Van Lu. Uh, we are an engineering firm here local in the Valley. Our address is 4550 North 12th Street in Phoenix. Uh, we were hired initially by the uh, developer in 2019, early uh, at, at, at the very beginning of the project to complete a full drainage assessment of the property. Uh, our analysis had nothing to do with the development itself, but had to do with the offsite drainage flows that would be coming from the north and east of the property. Uh, we've then provided that analysis to uh, the design team, and their design team, in conjunction with the developer, has worked very well to accommodate the offsite drainage flows through the project. Those drainage flows are not passing through local streets, they're passing through the existing open space corridors that are being left open, not only uh, to, you know, because of the open space requirements for the city, but also I'm sure is, 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 to, is a ways of providing or uh, preserving the native desert, but those native desert natural wash drainage corridors also transmit the uh, offsite drainage flows through the project. And, and that's being done in a very safe and, and, and manageable way. I've, I've reviewed the land plan that the developer has created in conjunction with their planning team and the open space corridors, in my professional opinion, are more than adequate to handle uh, the existing offsite drainage flows that are impacting the property. And as this project continues to evolve and move through the city process, uh, the city's own engineers will have 
uh, review of the of the detailed information that gets submitted as the project makes its way uh, through the development services department. Uh, the existing drainage corridors that are within parcel two and parcel three that are uh, not uh, currently uh, up for planning detailed planning at this time. Those are existing drainage corridors with existing drainage flows that are being untouched at this point. And any impacts to the existing environmental areas or caps, uh, that's happening today and has no, no bearing on this time. Thank you. And are you available to remain online in case any council members have questions or comments? Or no questions, not comments. Uh, our, it looks like our final yeah, yeah. public. Thank you. Yes, I'm here if you need me. Wonderful. Thank you. Our final speaker will be John Blue. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, Mayor and Council members. I appreciate the opportunity to talk. I want to say that when we moved in there, uh, while we enjoy the views, we knew someday that property would get developed and not opposed to development. I'm a business owner in the area as well. I am opposed to the density and the height of the buildings backing up to the preserve. Um, as other people have commented, you know, the views of the preserve. Uh, won't be the same with the buildings proposed. Uh, I don't like the PUD as a whole. I would like to see it broken up and the commercial part of it evaluated separately. Um, I, I appreciate what the developer has done to this point, but I still feel there's some more work to be done. And I would like to see this tabled for another 30 days, uh, see if we can work with the developer a little more and uh, get some, a uh, little more common ground on it. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much to everyone who testified. We will now close the public hearing. Uh, this item is in Councilman Waring's district, so if he is interested, I will turn to him first. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate it. I had a couple questions for Alan, uh, given a couple other things that have been said. Um, maybe I'll start. on the line. here. Uh, Councilman, we uh, are having a hard time quality. with sound quality. Have others lost Councilman Waring? Yes. No, yes. I can't. Okay. Thank you. Um, when we hear from Councilman Waring, we will come back to him. But in the meantime, do anyone else have uh, questions or comments? Um, I think Councilman Waring has been working very hard on this, and we will want to hear what he says. So in the meantime, um, I, I take very seriously concerns about flooding and, and do not want communities to experience uh, the type of, of damage that uh, Patty mentioned. Um, so a question for our planning director, Alan, can you talk about um, our process around flooding and specifically address uh, Mrs. Trite's comments? Certainly, Mayor, uh, Mayor, members of council, um, the way that drainage is, is handled uh, at the city of Phoenix is uh, as uh, the upfront entitlement process is really uh, through the zoning process that has 
statutory requirements spelled out that you're all familiar with in terms of working with the community. And so we let uh, applicants come forward, work with the community as part of the rezoning process. Um, they do as part of their due diligence, do some analysis as was, was mentioned uh, by CVL related to drainage and offsite flows to help their site plan team work on the site plan. But then they work with the public on the actual uh, zoning entitlements to see what is the public willing to, uh, to have built there. And it's through that discussion that the, the council, if a zoning case is approved, establishes some conditions of approval wherein they go on in the development process and there are existing city code requirements that kick into place that deal with an assortment of requirements that aren't part of, of a zoning case. Uh, one of which is grading and drainage uh, requirements. And so as part of the normal process within the department, if the zoning is approved, when they go on to develop it, they will be required to submit a grading and drainage study uh, as well as a grading and drainage plan that is reviewed by a civil engineer uh, at the city to ensure that all of the requirements are met and that uh, it deals with off-site flows, on-site retention, all the items that are, are necessary to be dealt with, uh, and that is uh, done and reviewed and approved before a final site plan uh, would get approved to go into a plat, which would come back to council and allow someone to, to legally sell any lots. Um, and so that's the, the normal process, uh, and as part of that normal process, there are times when developers have to lose lots just because the rezoning process uh, establishes a maximum number of lots, it doesn't uh, absolve you of the city code requirements to meet drainage. Um, and so there are lots of times when uh, an applicant has to revise uh, you know, their lot layout um, and their design based upon their, their drainage plan, and uh, they do that all the time through the process, uh, and that's you know, a normal part of, of that process. Um, I would add that we uh, have included a stipulation uh, within the memo that came out that requires that uh, that drainage study and uh, a conceptual grading and drainage plan be submitted and approved prior to uh, preliminary site plan approval, which is the very first uh, you know site plan approval in the formal process. Start to make sure that uh, the civil engineering team can talk with the site planning team in the department and. Uh, ensure that there aren't any issues with lots being uh, somewhere they shouldn't be where they're going to cause problems um, before there would be any preliminary approval of a site plan. That discussion will happen within the department. Thank you, Director Stevenson. I understand Councilman Waring is with us, so we will turn to Councilman Waring and then Councilwoman Estor. Okay, thanks, Mayor. I appreciate it. I, I don't know what happened there. I apologize. I could hear you guys just fine. So. Um, but uh, but so when I got off and then reconnected, somebody must have asked Alan about the drainage. Um, I just I had a couple follow up questions unless they were answered, and if so, I apologize while I was offline. So Alan, um, we've talked about the drainage a lot. I appreciate very much uh, Ms. Trite's efforts on this. Um, I know Patty talked to you uh, uh, as well as me on a conference call, but then several times offline with you. Um, you and I have talked about the City of Phoenix process compared to, say, the Scottsdale process. Uh, I've also talked to another councilwoman, uh, Pastor, uh, you know, about where we might go from here. But this case is already ongoing with our current rules. And I think, from what I could gather jumping into the middle of the conversation, you had just talked about how they're moving forward some of the processes that they would normally go through anyway. Uh, earlier so the neighbors can have more uh, comfort with this. I assume you talked about the things we can't make the developer do, like a bigger sort of county-wide or, or, or area-wide anyway um, uh, drainage study that, that's really bigger than the scope of their charge. Did, did you talk about that already, or can you explain why that's problematic if you haven't? Mayor Councilman Waring, uh, I did not address that issue. And uh, for the full benefit of the council and, uh, and the public, 
uh, what Council Waring is referencing is uh, what would be the normal uh, purview of the Maricopa County Flood Control District. They do regional uh, area-wide drainage uh, master plans and studies uh, throughout the county. That's part of why there's uh, you know, tax collected uh, relative to that, why the Flood Control District exists, is to do those big studies. Those uh, studies then are used by engineers on specific projects to talk about how much water is coming into the site. Um, and so one of the concerns uh, from the community was that the, um, the, the existing ADMP that's out there dates back to the mid-1990s and that the information was not accurate. And so we legally can't make uh, the current applicant do a you know, uh, 30 or 40 square mile area drainage master plan study to uh, ascertain how all of that water that's coming into the site. Um, but what we uh, have worked out with them is via the stipulation, uh, getting that information of what is available, what's reviewed by uh, you know, my civil engineering team, and having them uh, review and ensure that there aren't any issues or, or problems as this moves through the process. So there'll be that upfront discussion uh, just to double check everything and, and make sure that nothing slips through the cracks on this particular site. And then one of the other things that uh, the councilman uh, referenced is uh, that we have had discussions with Patty Trites uh, about looking at how the, the city does the drainage uh, review process in the future, but that would be a larger discussion that we would uh, then have to make some changes to. We're in the process of surveying other cities uh, within not only the metro region, but other large cities through, throughout the West. And so we have uh, surveyed some of them and got re information back. So for example, the city of Scottsdale does require a uh, conceptual drainage uh, study and plan be submitted as part of your zoning package. Uh, the city of Mesa does not require that if it's just zoning, but if it's a zoning and uh, a pre-plat and a plat process, then they do require it. Um, you can do those together. We separate those, and so the drainage always will happen before the, the pre-plat and plat stage, but we don't have it as part of the conceptual stage. Uh, Denver does not require it, um, but I believe Chandler does require it. So it's mixed information, uh, but we're continuing to evaluate that, and we'll um, you know, come back with some recommendations once we have further information on the process itself. So, uh, Mayor, if I can follow up on that. So, the original quest request, as I understood it, was to do this much bigger study. As Alan suggested, um, you know, this was a new request for me, so I hadn't had a case where this had come up before. Alan explained to me what he just explained to you, that legally we can't, we can't obligate them to do that. Um, we can, going forward, look at our process and try to change it for future cases. But but it's not appropriate to change. Well, Alan, let, let me put it to a different way. Has the city ever required a developer, any developer on any project, to do what would be suggested if we just took the neighbor's suggestion and just tried to implement it? This would be unprecedented in the city of Phoenix in development cases. Is that a fair assessment? Mayor uh, and um, Councilman Waring, yes. We uh, do not tie our zoning decisions to whether or not it meets the grading and drainage requirements. That is uh, a code requirement that is administered afterwards. Yeah, I just, I, I don't, I just can't find it in me to say after 18 months, we're gonna treat this group differently than we've treated every other group in the history of Phoenix. Going forward, we can change the rules so developers would know at the outset, this is our expectation. It's just like Scottsdale or something like that uh, going forward. But, but we, it would not apply to this case uh, in any event, even if we delayed it 30 days. Uh, that, to me, wouldn't be appropriate. However, somebody, and I can't remember who it was, um, earlier uh, on the, the neighbor side said something to the effect like it's the developer's choice whether to get rid of lots. So, Alan, if the development works around the study, the study doesn't work around the development, correct? So if the study comes back and says this is unsafe because of possible flooding, they will have to lose lots. 
that's not going to be an option. Maybe they won't lose lots or they'll just do whatever they want. The city will make them. They will have to adjust their plan if the study says they have to adjust their plan. Is that a fair statement? Mayor and Councilman uh, Waring, that's a fair statement with, with one uh, caveat that I want to put out there so that everyone understands. There's not just one uh, engineer design solution. There are multiple engineering design solutions. So it may be that uh, under one solution, they would have to lose lots, but if they did something else, they might be able to keep uh, you know, that lot, but that would increase their, their uh, you know, grading and drainage infrastructure costs. So for example, if you retained water somewhere else on the site, so it didn't go down somewhere else in the site, you might be able to retain one of those you know, lots down there that you could, uh, you know, you would lose if you didn't retain the water somewhere else. And so there's lots of, of engineering solutions that are possible. Those have costs associated with them, and it becomes a balance of, of costs associated with doing those improvements. Right. Well, thank you for that clarification. I mean, yeah, okay, you don't necessarily have to lose lots, but you are going to have to make some expensive modifications if that's what the study shows. Correct. Um, so, yeah. Yes, you will have to make yeah, those modifications. You will have to make those modifications to address all of the the drainage uh, concerns from uh, the civil engineering team as you go through that process. Thank you, Mayor. If it's okay, I'd also like to ask, uh, maybe at least starting with Alan about the ADEQ issue. Uh, I started to say Please this do. earlier, and then uh, apparently got cut off. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so, so the ADEQ issue. You, you, this this was kind of a long case kind of is probably doing it justice. But for, for a case of this size, this has been a long and winding road of 18 months. Try to get as much citizen input as possible. I think one of the village members mentioned that it seems like when one concern either got addressed or at least partially addressed, then, then there was a new concern. One of the major concerns was uh, what uh, Robin uh, Thomas from ADEQ had referenced earlier, you know, were there issues from previous uses at this property? Um, Alan, you know, this again was was outside the norm, at least in my experience. Uh, this had never come up before. So the state got involved, uh, city staff got involved fairly extensively, fairly early on, uh, delayed the project for quite some time. The developer had to spend quite a bit of money, uh, really at our insistence, uh, doing more environmental quality measures or examinations, I guess I should say. Um, but all those, and if, again, I her name's Robin Thomas, I believe it is, if she wants to chime in as well. But all those concerns were put to rest, was my understanding. Uh, obviously, the developer's still out the money, and there's still a delay, and it certainly delayed the project. But that's neither here nor there. At the end of the process, it appeared there's no reason on an environmental score to not move through with this, because it has been alluded to by a few of the comments from some of the neighbors. Is, is that a fair statement? Mayor Councilman Waring, uh, that is a, is a fair statement. When uh, this request was filed in June of 2019, uh, and upon staff's uh, initial review, uh, the environmental concerns were, were one of our issues, um, and as well as uh, some folks in the public had started raising some concerns because of the, the UPCO site that was formerly on that uh, area. And uh, staff did have internal meetings with the Office of Environmental Programs uh, to seek their guidance on, on resolving it. And, uh, and then also uh, there was discussions with uh, ADEQ and the applicant uh, you know, went back and volunteered to do some additional uh, studies relative to the environmental side of things uh, to ensure that that was not an issue going forward. And uh, to my knowledge from ADQ, that has been satisfied, but I would ask that uh, she be unmuted and, and she can add anything she'd like to that. Thank you. Thank you. So shall we go to Robin now, Councilman Waring? Yeah, if you would. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Robin Thomas. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is Robin Thomas with ADQ again. Uh, ADQ has had a, a long in, involvement at this site with uh, the Universal Propulsion Company. Uh, and just to cut to the, to the end, yes, it is correct. We, uh, we did some additional sampling uh, out there in, in recent months to ensure that the areas that are being looked at 
for residential development had no concerns uh, uh, for environmental contamination and we uh, satisfied those uh, questions and we believe that there are no concerns out there. Um, there is active groundwater remediation uh, occurring on the property, uh, but that does not impact uh, the area that is being proposed for, for development. Is there, if there's any other specific question, I will try to answer it. I don't have a specific question. Make sure to do as it should be. Uh, all of us address my satisfaction. May I proceed, Mayor? Thank with you, a Council. Other, uh, yes, please. Oh, sorry. Thank you. So, uh, for Alan, so I just want to make sure. So, they're putting in a stoplight. Question. I just want to make sure it's in the stick. They're putting in a stoplight. They're putting in the fire hydrant that was requested. I think those are also 200 or so grand. Um, those are in the stick, right? That's not, because it was a little unclear the way it was said in the presentation. So I just want to make sure that that's going to happen. So, uh, Mayor and members of council, yes, uh, the applicant is required to uh, complete and finalize their traffic impact statement for the development. They would have to do any uh, street improvements that come out of that study, in addition to what's in the staff report, uh, based upon street transportation department's approval. And in addition to that, uh, they are stipulated to uh, provide 100% funding for the cost of traffic signal installation at the intersection of Central Avenue and Happy Valley Road uh, at the time of final site plan approval for phase one of the development, which is the single family residential homes uh, as approved by the street transportation department. So they would have to substantiate uh, you know, the, the requirements of the street transportation department as it relates to traffic, but they will be the ones paying for the traffic light, not the city. Uh, and that stipulation 18. And then new stipulation uh, 22 uh, requires the fire hydrant uh, to be uh, provided at the southeast corner of Central and Yearling. Thank you. Can I go back to the stoplight really quick? So just so it's clear, the, the traffic department is not going to transportation department isn't going to say, don't put in a light. They will have uh, defined criteria for what an acceptable light is and the developer will have to meet that. The developer is going to have to meet the city standards. They can't just throw, to throw up some kind of light that's not up to code. That, that's really what you meant when you were talking about the, the stoplight, correct? Mayor Councilman Waring, uh, they are going to have to meet uh, a light that meets all the city traffic light standards, but they also uh, will have to substantiate a traffic warrants and show that uh, there's a need for the, the traffic light there. And so that's part of their traffic impact assessment and study that they will do and then work with the streets department on that. Uh, we don't, because you are, when you're talking about a street light and, and right of way, there are additional uh, public safety concerns. There are federal traffic uh, requirements and standards. We don't stipulate as part of a zoning case that they get to do that and not have to meet those requirements. What we stipulate is they have to pay for the traffic light so that way when those things are worked out and, and met, the, it's not on the city to have to pay for that traffic light. It would be on the developer. So they have to meet, uh, I think it's the international code, right? Uh, I forget what it's called, the international traffic code. They have to meet that criteria but assuming that's met, they have to pay for the light, not the taxpayers of the scheme. Correct. Thank you. Um, and then you covered the hydrants. Um, you know, this has been a, this has been a long case. Uh, you know, obviously it passed the village and it passed planning. Um, I, I don't think it should be continued. I just think 18 months, I look at the list of things that have been done and frankly the cost of those things um, it's, it's a lot of effort has gone into this on a lot of people's parts. And uh, to the folks who commented on the public infrastructure, the fire hydrant and the stop street lights and so forth, that does matter, you know, the fixing up of, of Central, you know, that does matter um, to residents. 
And uh, I understand the concerns of the neighbors across the street, but I did appreciate the gentleman's comment. You know, something was going to go there. Something was always going to go there. And it, it just, it seems like in this particular case, it's sort of been one thing after another coming up with why something shouldn't go there. Uh, and I do think the developer has, my mind, uh, you know, had a lot of meetings on this subject and has provided a lot of value for the community. So I'll just stop there and see if anybody else has any questions, uh, but I appreciate the time, Mayor, to flesh this out. Thank you. Thank you. We know you've been working hard on this one. Uh, I think, is Councilwoman Pastor next? Yes, I just, uh, well, I don't know if I, I think I'm next. Yes, Councilwoman uh, Pastor, please. I just wanted to talk to Alan really quickly. Alan, I know that in this case, uh, the drainage report, it wasn't required or isn't part of the process. What I really would like to see is that this be part of the process moving forward. And I know you're looking at different cities and uh, doing the research, but I would like it to come back so that we can incorporate it into our uh, zoning uh, process so that there's no other uh, constituents or areas that get caught up in this the way this this case has. That's, I don't know if it, it, it's a combo here or, you know, how staff says, oh, I need a directive. So I don't know if this is the proper place or where to put it. Uh, Mayor, uh, Councilwoman Pastor, certainly once staff is done with uh, research, we could go to, uh, you know, the appropriate city council subcommittee and have a discussion about it and go from there, if that sounds good. That sounds great. Thank you, Councilwoman. Any additional council member comments or questions? Um, and let's see, we have a motion on the table and a second, is that right? Mayor, this is the city clerk. We need a motion and a second at this time. Thank you. Councilman uh, Waring, do you have a suggested motion? I do, uh, sorry, I have to toggle back and forth, Mayor. Um, uh, so I, uh, I guess for the city attorney, can I, or the city clerk, can I move both of them together or do they have to be separate motions? Mayor, uh, Councilman Waring, they have to be separate motions. So okay. item 39, general plan first, that's a resolution and then a vote. Okay, thank you. I move to approve item number 39, uh, GPA-2-19-2 uh, for the Planning Commission recommendation and adopt the re related resolution. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 8-0. We next move to item 40, Councilman Waring. Move to approve item 40, Z-37-19-2 for the memo from the plan development director dated September 1st, 2020 and adopt the related ordinance. Second. Roll call. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 8-0. Thank you. That concludes our planning and zoning agendized items. We next move to item 42 related to reopening of city parks. Uh, we will begin this item with a presentation from our staff. I will uh, introduce Deputy City Manager Inger Erickson. I think it may be my first time introducing her with that title. So congratulations to Inger. 
and uh, if you would introduce your co-presenters as well, thank you. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Uh, today, uh, Tracy Hall, uh, who is the Acting Parks and Recreation Director, is here to give you a brief presentation um, on the topic. Good afternoon, members, Mayor and members of the council. Again, I'm Tracy Hall, the Acting Director for the Parks and Recreation Department, and today we're here to discuss the reopening of outdoor athletic fields. On April 2nd, 2020, all Phoenix reservable outdoor fields were closed due to, to the coronavirus pandemic. The item before you today is a result of a three-person council member memo requesting the consideration to reopen reservable outdoor fields. For background purposes, the city's Flatland Park res reservable field inventory consists of 74 turf fields, 19 baseball fields, 51 softball fields, and at Reach 11, we have 17 tournament fields, one synthetic soccer field, and four youth baseball fields. Currently, Ari Phoenix is the only Arizona city that has not opened outdoor fields for organized sports, but only six of the Arizona cities are hosting tournaments in their municipal fields. The Center for Disease Control provides guidance related to coronavirus transmission and precautionary methods. Per the CDC, there is a high risk of transmission in sports competitions between teams. The CDC also states that the more participation interaction, the closer the physical interaction, the more equipment shared by multiple players, and the longer the interaction, the higher the risk of COVID-19 spread. Furthermore, the CDC notes that outdoor activities are safer than indoor activities. The CDC's recommendation for youth sports include wearing masks when possible, players bringing their own equipment when possible, players staying six feet apart when possible, cleaning of hands before and after practices, games, and when sharing equipment, and of course, a player should stay home or notify their coach when they do not feel well. The Parks and Recreation Department has followed COVID-related metrics as part of our reopening plan. This is in line with recommendations from the National Recreation and Parks Association. The metric evalu evaluations include a downward trajectory in influenza-like illnesses and COVID-like symptoms with the 14 day, within a 14-day period, a downward trajectory of documented cases or positive tests within a 14-day period, and the ability for hospitals to treat patients and have a robust testing program in place for at-risk essential healthcare workers. All three metrics have been met in Maricopa County. Maricopa County is in the moderate transmission category for state standards, and the county currently shows a 14-day decrease in COVID-19 trends. If we are to open up reservable fields for play again, we will utilize our existing reservation and allocations process for organized groups. Practices and games will be allowed. Reservations and all allocations will be taken for turf, softball, and baseball fields. And as a reminder, turf field usage limits 48 kids or 24 adults for play on the fields. Also, with a high level of field usage, we will need to open adjacent park restrooms to accommodate our user groups. In the light of the coronavirus pandemic, and if this item is approved, we will add a few requirements to our field permit guidelines. These include the commitment of the teams and organizations to follow guidelines and restrictions, commitment from the teams and organizations to inform parents and coaches of the guidelines and restrictions, spectators, officials, and coaches will be required to wear masks, physical distancing will be encouraged unless spectators are from the same household, and there will be a six foot dis distance between the sports field and spectators. We will also implement modified allocation schedules to include time for any necessary cleaning between use 
and to reduce the potential for crowding. The enforcement of the new requirements, as well as our existing requirements, will be an effort largely led by teams and the organizations. Each team or organization will agree to self-monitor their practices and games. This process will be enhanced by them having an on-site compliance person. In addition, we have rovers who visit multiple park sites during their shift. They will observe games and practices and see if safety measures are in place. We also have flatland park rangers rotating amongst park to assist with education and ensure park rules are being met. Our goal is always to lead with education, but continuous and egregious violations could lead to suspension of future reservations and allocations. If council should approve this item, we will need one week to reopen our fields. This concludes our, the formal presentation and we're able to answer any questions. Thank you for that presentation. Mayor, uh, Mayor, I'm sorry. Uh, Councilwoman Stark, yes. Thank you. Um, have you had an opportunity to talk to some of the other surrounding cities um, that have opened up their play fields and how successful their enforcement has been? We have been in communication, uh, I'm sorry, Mayor and Council Member, we have been in communication with the other cities and um, most cities are using self-enforcement, so requiring the teams and the organizations to enforce the rules. So it sounds like we're probably going above and beyond what some of the other surrounding cities are doing by having the rovers out there? Yes, the rovers are our part, mayor and council member, the oh. rovers, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> The rovers are part of our part-time recreation staff that when we have park activities, they would normally do this. So they are not being assigned because of this. Um, this okay. would be uh, their normal duties that now that we're back to play. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Mayor. Um, yes, um, so, you know, as a mother of two young children, you know, who is jug juggling the impact of virtual learning for my oldest, I understand the, trust me, I understand the frustration, the stress of, uh, of our families, the anxiety that our young, that our young people are going through right now. Like, trust me, I hear it every single day, every single hour of the day that I'm at home. But as a mother, I am also looking at the positivity rates in my neighborhood. I don't know if many of you guys saw it, but there was an article um, written last, I think it was last week. Um, there was a story last week as well that Maryville has two of the highest zip codes. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how we, how would I even see opening up um, Maryville Park, um, seeing, um, you know, how our, and also Park, I'm um, seeing that that I have the highest cases in, in, in my district. I know that we're doing a lot of things to get testing, to try to figure out how do we, how do we get a handle of this? Um, but I am personally like very, very nervous as, you know, as I see the, the cases rising in that part. In that part of my district, my team and I have been out to the, to the mobile testing sites. I mean, we've been talking to folks. I mean, I was there one day and I want to say that I must have spoken, you know, with at least 20 people to letting them know that they had the virus in, in their system. Like, um, I had never experienced something like that. Um, so it was just very scary just to see the faces of our, of our community and how people were feeling about it, the, how they were feeling about this. It has been almost two months since we last heard from our healthcare and public health community as a council, I understand and appreciate the need to be to create a reopening strategy for our city. I'm 100% open about that. Like I've always had an open door and open mind to figuring to figuring that out. Um, but before we begin to shift course on the significant measures we have taken as a city to slow the spread of this virus, I would like to hear from health professionals, I get it that we've presented a plan and I get it that we're following CDC guidelines, 
but their input is vital to creating a more comprehensive plan to reopening uh, much more of our city services and, and amenities. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Garcia. Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Oh. So I had some questions for staff. One, does opening the fields mean that we will be moving forward with our own organized leagues like the softball leagues or basketball leagues and other leagues? Mayor, council member, not at this time. We would op open up the field for organized play from other groups. Okay. Um, is there a recommendation on timetable as to when we would open up from the staff or when would you be ready uh, with these guidelines and be able to train our staff and be able to let the public know that this is happening? Mayor, council member, are you referring to the athletic fields? Yes. So we know that it would take us one week to implement from the date that it's approved um, to implement and reopen our fields for athletic field use. Okay. And then one of the last questions I have is, um, I know we were in the process of obtaining, obtaining some experts um, that are gonna help us out in thinking through the reopening or how we're moving forward with the pandemic. I don't know if that question is to you, Ed, or where we are at with that. Thank you, Mayor Councilmember Garcia. Yes, we have uh, currently procured a, uh, a group of health professionals who have been advising staff on the uh, event requests, uh, specific, you know, if somebody wants to hold something in the convention center or uh, at a, a large event at a hotel where the governor has given the charge to cities to be uh, able to allow that, we have a group that does that. However, that group has not been procured to be a general health advisor, but the assistant city manager is working on getting that, so we should soon have the ability to use a group of health advisors for the larger questions of um, public health like this that we're asking beyond just specific events. So that will be coming to the council this month. So we'd still, is there a way to have a timetable of when we would be able to count on that expertise? I, I don't know for sure that I can say exactly. I know that uh, Milton is working to get the get the a group, um, get a contract or organized with that group for that extra amount of work. So I'd like to say we might uh, be able to do something by September 16th formal agenda, two weeks from today. Um, but I'll have to, to check and make sure we can do that so I can advise you uh, specifically. But that would be a goal, Councilman member, to, is to uh, have something by the 16th if we can. All right. Well, having said that, I think to me it would make sense to, to give those folks an opportunity to look at our plan. So if we're talking September 16th that we're able to get those, those folks on board and then it's going to take a week for staff to be ready to open. I think I would suggest that we're if we're going to move forward with this that we would look at uh, October first, possibly as the as the first date that we can open, um, knowing that we would need to let staff know, and uh, and personally would appreciate to have those health experts look through our plans and make sure that they they they're the best possible, and and just hearing from the vice mayor. Uh, district 8 along with district 5 I know district 5 has been the hardest hit we're right behind them and so it, it, it is really concerning um, but also balancing that with the need um, for our youth to be outside to exercise and do all these sorts of things and so um, I would be supportive if we would come up with a date um, that gives us ample time to make sure that we do it right um, and that sounds like uh, uh, around the 1st of, of next month is is what makes sense to me. Mayor councilman DeCicio and then vice mayor. Uh, thank you, mayor. Thank you for that. So, you know, everybody has different concerns because, you know, we have just such a, a huge city. Um, and 1 of the things that I've floated around to other council members is that every district is different. Councilwoman uh, Guardado's district is been hit very hard and totally understandable why she has those kinds of concerns. My district, in, you know, in respect, hasn't been so much. 
and I know that other council members do. So I'd like to put a motion on the table, Mayor, that I think will accommodate everybody that allows every council member to be able to choose their own openings, their own, uh, what kind of things they want to open. Like I would like to open up in my district organized sports as well. Uh, the whole issue dealing with this, and Councilman uh, Garcia made a really good point. These kids need to be outside. They need to be able to be out there playing with other kids. And we've heard multiple individuals within the medical community, we've heard this saying that, hey, if you're outside, you're pretty safe. Are you 100% safe? No, that's never going to happen. But when it comes to sports, we are pretty safe. So I'd like to put a motion on the table, and then I'd like to ask the parks director just a quick question, a couple of questions on that. So my motion on the table, Mayor, is to open up our parks, including organized play, that would also allow each individual council member to make the determination for their own district what is and what isn't safe time-wise. Uh, that puts the responsibility on each of us to be able to make sure we're doing it right. And that's my motion on the table, Mayor. And then I'll get into, um, go ahead, Mayor. Was that a second? Okay, second. okay, thank you for that, Councilwoman uh, Williams. So I'd like to ask the Parks Director, Tracy, Tracy, what's going on in Tempe right now? Where, what have they allowed opened? So, as I stated previously, all of the other cities are allowing um, athletic play, and Tempe is opening up a series of their amenities, including um, other park amenities as well as field play. And then Gilbert and Mesa and all those are all pretty much open, correct? Correct. And, and as I mentioned previously, only six of those cities are actually allowing tournaments, but they are allowing, all of these cities are allowing either games or practices. And so this is, this is for the other council members. People that are wealthy are able to pay to have their kids go to other parks across the country. That, that's just a fact. People that are inner city that are having a difficult time are the ones that cannot travel to other parks. So what's happening is, and this is happening in my district and it's happening across the city of Phoenix, is that kids in my district, which, you know, my district is actually okay. I mean, when it comes to having income, they do that. They're able to travel, they're able to do those things. Same thing's happening with education without getting into this entire debate on that. But what's happening is people that have a little bit of wealth or any type of wealth are able to travel with their kids to other parks around the, around the state. People that are lower income, the ones that are having difficulty, are going to have the hardest time because they can't. They have working families. My family was extremely poor. Uh, the most my mom and dad ever made was 21000 a year combined at the height of their ability to make it money, right? So. My mom and dad could never have done this. They could never have gotten in the car, taken us to another gate because they worked so hard. They worked hard. Hardworking families always have a difficulty with this. But by allowing other districts the opportunity and the ability to be able to open up, then that what, what that does is it allows us to be able to monitor those areas. And I'm willing to take that risk as a city council member. I've got two little kids that do use our park system, but, and I totally get it. If you are hard hit, you are concerned about this and you should be. So from my end, I would appreciate any vote we can get to allow those districts, whether it's in district two, district one, district six, or whatever else, to be able to open up and allow us to be able to work with the city staff to be able to do that. That way you could monitor it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. From my perspective, we need to make decisions based on public health data, not politics. And so to the extent we have any policies that are different across the city, it would need to be driven by public health metrics. But I think it's also important that we recognize that many of these leagues have fields scheduled that are not in their immediate neighborhood and that we already have many young people traveling across the city. So while I uh, do see a path forward to reopening parks, a district by district policy 
without public health data is not something that I would be comfortable supporting. We will go to the vice mayor and then Councilman Garcia. Yeah, I mean, I, I would be supportive on the suggestion that council member council member Garcia made um, for us to do this um, data driven. Like I said, I'm open to the idea that I that I understand that we need to get to a place where we need to, you know, where we need to think about reopening. I, I get it. I have two little kids as well that use the parks um, a lot. Um, so I, I understand that. Um, but I would I would be supportive of that if that's if that's what we could if we could move towards that having professionals come in and then setting a date for for October 1st. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Garcia. Yes, Mayor. Thank you for for your comment before. I think so. It's 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 tough when we have these conversations because the reason that more people are impacted, more people have COVID in our uh, in our districts is because they are more low income people of color, and because they are more at risk. I feel like it it makes no sense to do the the what you have suggested. Um, I do want to ask one question to. Uh, I have a substitute motion, but I want to ask a question to, to staff. Um, are we talking about all parks and everything? Or are we talking about courts or, or fields? It was my understanding that we were talking just about fields today. Mayor, mem council member, the motion that was presented from the three council members was just for outdoor athletic fields. So if we were to consider anything else in parks, that would have to be brought back to us um, from the council. Okay. So. I would want to make a substitute motion that we open up uh, the outdoor athletic fields um, on October 1st um, and only if we are by then able to get a, a support from the health care or the health folks that are going to advise us. Um, so the substitute motion would be open October 1st um, with the consultation of um of the health experts second thank you so we have a motion a substitute motion with a second uh councilwoman pastor yes um this is a a, a dynamic dialogue I, uh, because if you look at the numbers and you look and so you're not far behind me, your, your, your area is 500 behind me, but, uh, if we're really going to, um, start to move this way, I would like to see, uh, data and public uh, and get a public health opinion on this. I know that other areas have opened up. Um, but the hardest hit areas, if you look at them, are uh, five, seven, eight, and then four, and then it goes from there. And if you really study those areas and look at the maps and really look at the census data of, of the areas of poverty, uh, it seems to be in those areas. Uh, other districts have pockets of it, but uh, those are the core districts that are being hit the hardest. And uh, and it's also our, our poverty area and we're, we're getting testing out there so we can see where our hotspots are. And as uh, Vice Mayor Guardado had said that she had spoken to uh, 20 families, uh, we had an incident uh, just recently where we discovered a hotspot within our city and, uh, and the tests were not, uh, the tests were valid and uh, we had to go in and really put some measures in there in that hotspot. So if you're watching what's happening within our great city, we need to uh, make sure that we're doing the best that we can before we truly open up uh, at the level that we wanna open up. Uh, but I do agree because I have been asked uh, many times by many teams, when are we going to open up the fields? When can we get 
uh, practices in. And I think that's important also. So I would agree with uh, the substitute motion as to let's have a plan. And if we're going to do it, get the uh, uh, advice and, and looking at the numbers and really studying it so that then October 1st, we can be able to open up at least the fields. Thank you. Mayor, Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Councilman Waring. Thank you. Uh, so I, I think we should open up the fields. Um, I, I just think it's time. Uh, it's not going to be 100% safe, but I do think people can also make decisions about whether they want to participate in certain activities or not, or in consultation with their children, they can make those same decisions. I understand that different areas of the city have been impacted, so I understand the point that Sal's getting at. Um, I, I do think we heard quite a bit of testimony, and unless I'm misremembering, from uh, both county health officials, from uh, uh, former Surgeon General Carmona uh, back in the spring that talked about the importance, as I recall it, of, of being outside. Now, it's not just kids either. It's not just kids who use our fields. Uh, also, in District 2, you know, we have Reach 11. So that's a, I don't want to say amenity, but it's really bigger and more important than that. And we've got a lot of people who want to use that field, and we obviously invest a lot of resources in keeping those fields nice and ready for play for leagues and so forth. Um, at this point, the gyms are open, you know, that's citywide. Uh, facilities are open citywide. Uh, I personally, you know, you can't make people go. I think the polling around the country has shown that, you know, just because stuff is open doesn't mean people are all going to flock to it. Uh, I've talked to friends of mine from the gym. They're not going back to the gym yet. Um, that's their personal decision. I understand that the personal decisions you make might impact someone else if you give it to them. But as long as people are following the guidelines, you know, as laid out by the CDC, they should be safe. I understand it's harder to police kids, but it's not just kids using our fields. And hopefully with correct supervision from parents, you know, hopefully the kids will be safe and get the much needed exercise uh, after being cooped up all summer. And then a lot of the spring when they normally have been outside, you know, with the nice weather. Uh, we're heading into the nice weather again. I, I don't know exactly what the magic would be of October 1st. I do understand it might be good to get another, it would be good to get another briefing just just because it would be good to get another briefing about about what experts think about this. But we've already kind of had those briefings in the spring. I believe that it's not overt advice. The guidance we sort of got, as I remember it, was don't close the trails, don't, you know, don't don't do too much of that. People need to get out. That can actually be more harmful than actually closing them to prevent the virus. So I would be supportive of opening up uh the field at the earliest possible, um, earliest opportunity, certainly before October 1st, and do it to the full city. I, I think it's time, and I think people can make their own uh, choices. Thank you. Mayor. Councilwoman Stark. Thanks. Um, I could go either way, but I think we need to, we need to get the fields open just looking at some of my neighbors with their their children, they're cooped up in the house, they really haven't had a lot of social interaction. So I think it's important. It sounds to me like there's been a lot of research on how to open up these fields. Um, I mean, I, I could go, again, either way, but I think uh, Councilman Wary makes a, a great argument in that the gyms are now open, but people are not flocking to them. So people really are thinking through what they want to do as far as their 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 safety, their health, and and, and I'm sure these parents would think about that as well. Um, so I'm I'm kind of here in with a mixed motion, <laughs> not sure which direction to go. Um, but I I I think Jim did make the best point that we've seen what's happened with the gyms and people just aren't flocking back. So people are still taking lots of precautions. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Stark. I think it is important to note that the gyms are open, but uh, at reduced capacity. 
And we have seen uh, communities reopen sports. Most have done it, uh, particularly with outdoor sports, which as the CDC pointed out and, and Director Hall pointed out, outdoor is, we think, significantly lower risk. So I think that's an important factor. The Arizona Interscholastic Association convened a group of healthcare professionals to help advise them on their decisions to reopen. And they have a, a fairly extensive plan that uh, I think is similar, but has some additional information that we haven't discussed. And it may be something that the Parks Department has included um, that generally seemed responsible to me. They did have uh, no water fountains, and I am comfortable with our existing water fountains policy, but they did include some things such as temperature checks, which I think is worth considering. Uh, so perhaps we could have a little bit of a discussion on that when we have our coronavirus update at our next policy session, which is on this coming Tuesday. Um, I think we need to be aware that we have to continue looking at best practices. Arizona has done an amazing job. Arizonans have done an amazing job Masking up, uh, we have seen really encouraging statistics in terms of uh, ventilator use, ICU bed capacity for COVID. But as our vice mayor pointed out, we are still losing too many Arizonans and there is still suffering. So we also have to be nimble. Uh, we know that as we reopen gradually, we will see more COVID cases and we have to look at what happens if schools return and we see a significant flu outbreak. What does that do to our hospitals? Uh, unfortunately, we just have to keep looking at what the data tells us and be guided by that. And as we learn more about the science of COVID, we have to respond to what science and public health is doing, is telling us. So uh, I'll next turn to Councilman Nowakowski. Thank you, Mayor. So um, Tracy, can you go back to that slide where it says, um, I think it said current PRD matrix for reopening? Mayor, council member, just one second, and we will get back to that slide. No, no problem. This one? Um, no, the, I think it's uh, one before that. No, okay. The enforcement? No, not In the enforcement on current PRD, I think it said. Oh. Keep on going, keep this on one. going. Yeah, so can you explain to us exactly what does that mean? I mean, is that a standard that everybody's following or is it because if we're talking about a matrix for reopening, we could bring in the county experts, um, we could bring in the uh, state experts and is this what they're actually putting out? And is this what we're gonna be following or I'm not sure, can you explain it to me? Council member, uh, mayor, council member, yes, these are the metrics that we identified in the closures as to how we would measure when we were capable of reopening. These were these are also metrics listed by the CDC, but endorsed by the National Recreation and Parks Association as as they are a guiding organization for parks systems and and city or um, departments. And these are the same uh, metrics that are used to evaluate whether or not you're able to reopen. So probably our colleagues from different cities are going off of this matrix for the reopening of their, their parks and fields, right? I cannot, Mayor, Council Member, I cannot confirm that they're using these metrics, but I can confirm that these are the metrics advised by the National Recreation and Parks Association as well as the CDC. Okay, so you know one of the one of the issues that I have is in District Seven is when you drive by our parks, you have individuals that are practicing football, that are playing soccer, that are out there unofficially using our fields, right? So I mean, right now there's not any type of uh, rules or regulations or any type of safety methods, and um, basically there's no enforcement to stop those individuals. Um, people have been calling our office and then basically we make our park staff aware to, of it, but there's not really a, a type of enforcement at the city level right now that we're really going after those individuals. Saying that, um, I believe that people are doing it. 
as we speak. You drive it to any city park right now, you'll probably see somebody out there playing football, soccer, or basketball, or baseball. So I, I believe that if people are doing it already, that we're gonna, if we are gonna reopen our, our fields, that we should actually have some kind of standards that people have to um, follow. I know that we had a slide that talked about self um, monitoring and some stipulations that they have to follow. Um, so my concern is that they're already doing it. How are we gonna educate those individuals? I know that once they reserve the parks, they reserve the fields, that's our opportunity to actually educate them on that. But those individuals that are just getting together like right now, and they're not asking for permission, they're just doing it. Um, do we have a plan on basically educating those individuals on what the um, what the rules and regulations are and that there's an opportunity for that team or organization to actually um, go uh, reserve that that park or that soccer field. The other thing too is that uh, one of the things is there a fair process because I know that there's a lot of club balls and, and teams out there that are organized and that basically if you have the money you can afford to participate in it and they can go out there and organize and, and reserve the parks but there's a lot of those neighborhood baseball soccer basketball teams that just come together they have no money um they're just kids from the neighborhood playing another another group of kids from the neighborhood um would there be some way somehow to create some type of a fee or a waiver where these organizations or these groups can actually um, apply for um, the uses of our parks because that's basically what I'm seeing out there is that people that aren't official leagues or club balls um, are, are out there playing. So those are just some of the questions that I have, some of the concerns that I'm seeing out there. I know that we have those rovers and we have park rangers. Um, they can't cover what we have right now. I mean, it's it's sad that we're shorthanded right now with the um, park rangers and rovers. So I think we're gonna have to have some other system to really go out there and, and do and monitor the um, sites uh, with uh, maybe with some of our park staff or others, right? And basically to make sure that enforcement part is being held. And, and saying all that, I have, a, I have children in high school and grammar school and basically their schools are starting to open up and they're actually playing sports and practicing right now and they have different phases and um, i was just wondering how can we phase this out also where we start to open up the um, fields and then we can open up another component of the parks and and just extend it until we're ready to open up the full park so i'm supportive of opening up the parks parks but basically um, I'm concerned about the self um, monitoring. I don't think the groups or the organizations will do that in the proper way. I believe what the mayor was talking about is if we can have somehow some way where they can take people's temperature, ask if you've been coughing, sneezing, or if you've been out of the country, or if you've been around somebody who has COVID to answer some of those basic questions. And basically if they say yes to any of them, that they shouldn't participate in that organized sports so those are just some comments of mine and um and it's hard to say um but i i believe that opening up the parks for the kids as long as it's organized and we have some kind of safety precaution would be okay for me thank you mayor thank mayor? you uh councilman nowakowski um one thing we could do is support Councilman Garcia's motion and then invite a member of the Sports and Medicine Advisory Committee of AIA to come and speak to the council um, so that we could get the feedback because they have had uh, medical professionals already look at these particular issues and I understand had some, some robust debate around these issues and, and I think we would benefit from, from understanding and then I think our community might also appreciate some consistency between our school system and, and our parks. Councilman DeCicio. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I think what Councilman Nowakowski said was perfect. 
Because when you go to a doctor's office, they have literally a checkoff list of things that you have to ask, like have you had a fever, have you been out of the country, have you done all these things. If it's okay with the second, I would like to add that to our motion, to my motion, to add that list of questions to each of the kids and the family members that are there. So that way we're sure that these individuals, at least they've claimed to be this way because that's what happens with the doctor's office. And, you know, there's no way of knowing for sure, but at the end of the day, this is, you know, I think that's a great checkoff list. So I'd like to add that to the motion, if that's okay with Zelda. Are you talking your original motion? Table. Yes, Mayor. Mayor, oh, yes, Mayor Councilman DeCicio, De um, it, it's not a proper amendment to amend a motion that's not on the table at this point. Okay. There's an alternate, there's an um, oh, substitute motion on the table right now. You could ah, make that potentially. I got there. it. Okay, well, I, uh, yes. I will add that to the motion because I think that's a very logical thing that Councilman Nowakowski is asking for. Okay, so if, if this uh, Councilman Garcia's motion does not move forward, we, we can turn to you for an amendment. But I do have some concerns about the legality of the original motion. And so I would turn to either our city manager or our city attorney about the legality of that particular motion. Looking to the mayor, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the city attorney about whether it's it's proper to talk about the underlying motion while the other one's on the floor to that question, Chris. Um, I think it it's appropriate to discuss the the other motion because it may be relevant to the vote on this okay. motion. You can't amend the motion, but um, the effect in Councilman DeCicio's statement that he would want to add that is is an appropriate. Um, so, Mayor, I think well. on the on the other one uh, to the city attorney's clarification, then that this might inform it. I think there's a practical issue with the, the, the motion about uh, going council district by council district. One of those is that we've never done any sort of program implementation on a citywide basis with each individual council member dis determining what happens in their own specific district. So that's, that's a, both a problem for staff to know how to implement that. We'd have to consult with a council member about every park in their district. But I, I'll let the city attorney speak to us whether that's, that's even possible to do in in mayor members of the council I, I believe as you you all know you're elected to represent a district as part of a body like a state legislature um, it, that election doesn't give each council member authority to enact or take enact laws or take actions specific to their district alone um, toward council um, members to CCO's motion it may be possible that each council member is able to recommend the plan for their district and the facilities in their district based on the data that is available, but the, I still think the council, the entire council, would need to approve that plan. Um, Mayor, from that point. Thank you. Uh, I saw council member Garcia. I saw council member Garcia first, so we'll go to council member Garcia and then councilman DeCicio and then councilman Williams. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think what both Councilman Nowakowski and, and Councilman DeCicio uh, described is exactly would be ideal. If we could have the resources to be able to have uh, nurses and people checking people at every park, yes, let's open tomorrow, but we just don't have that. Schools don't even have that. As a spouse of an educator and watching them go through their reopening process and they're still not reopening for a while, um, I, I've, I've gotten uh, uh, to understand and see how difficult that's been, even to get thermometers or enough thermometers for schools. And so capacity wise to think that in any way, we're gonna go from what staff is suggesting that people self, you know, self take care of themselves to all of a sudden being able to provide the ability to take temperature or support people in this way is not realistic. And so in my motion, I'm just simply asking, Let's figure a couple of these things out. We would have uh, four weeks to figure this out. Outreach to some more health experts some public health experts. Let's give our staff ample time to prepare themselves. Let's educate community that this is going to be opening and these are the expectations we're going to have. We're, I'm just asking for four, 
for four weeks to be able to get those things done so that when we do open, it's the safest possible. And the last question to Chris, and since you're, you're there, Chris, is there any liability? I know schools are dealing with this where there some schools are suggesting that because of the risk, uh, there might be some waivers that need to be um, signed by students or parents. Is there any liability of that sort that can impact this park's decision? Mayor, Councilman Garcia, yes, there are things that we would recommend that we do as far as liability, waivers, um, assumption of the risk. We have had discussions about putting that in the documents and the agreements that are done. We've even discussed um, having a requirement that the organizations that are applying to use the fields um, provide a specific waiver or assumption of the risk notice to the individual we are participating. Um, it, as far as liability for us opening in COVID-19, there will undoubtedly be claims filed, and I probably shouldn't talk too much about this in an open meeting, but let's, it, it's obvious that it's going to be almost impossible to prove exactly where and how you caught the virus to be able to um, single out one entity or, or one event as being the cause um, in order to sustain a claim, but that's not impossible. Councilman DeCicio, followed by Councilman Williams. Thank you, Mayor. I mean, we're able to have bus service where it's a lot tighter conditions and than you're going to have out in the field where kids are playing and things like that. At the end of the day, we're either going to want to get these kids out there playing or not. Four weeks is a long time for these kids. They've been waiting a long time. Other cities, we've seen it across the state. Pretty much every city has opened up but us. I mean, almost everybody's opened up but us. <laughs> so, you know, we can have people doing the thermometers. I mean, that's not that expensive. They can be out there doing it. We don't have to have nurses doing it. You can have individuals doing that, checking to see what their temperature is. When I go to a doctor's office, they don't have a nurse checking my temperature. They have the person at the front office checking it to make sure that I'm okay. They sign off on the waiver. So from my end, I really believe we need to find a way. It's easy to get to know. It's, easy, it's harder to get to yes. So if it's, you know, like according to what Chris Meyer said, I would, I would change, I know I'm not able to do it now, but I would change my motion to say that based on the recommendation of the council member so that I accept responsibility. I will accept that responsibility to allow my kids to play in my area. They need to do that. <laughs> this needs to happen. It is so hard to watch these kids be stuck in their homes right now when, in fact, they need to be out in the field. We've heard multiple individuals from the health community say being a environment for them to be in. They need that. They need to be these things. You heard me earlier talk about kids that are underprivileged. <laughs> they need to be outside. They cannot afford to go to other places. So people in my district are going to other places across the state. That's what's happening right now. They need to be able to be open. So I would be happy to change that to a recommendation from the council office. And, and I'd be happy to accept whatever responsibility is required. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman Williams. Thank you, Mayor. I think that Councilman Waring made excellent points. We have seen a major reduction in COVID cases. We get a report every day, sometimes twice a day, that shows how it's continuing, the number of cases we have, uh, the hospitalizations. I think we need to let the children go to the ball fields. I think it's healthy for them. I think it's something that the leagues want. And I think it's a great exercise. I would like to see us open these as very soon as possible. I'm getting probably 100 emails a week of parents requesting this. And I think it's important that we recognize how important it is to families and to young people and to parents. I'm, my kids were all in the sports. I'm a firm believer in it. I think it's not only healthy, it keeps them out of trouble, it keeps them concentrating on something else. So I really would like to see us open these fields. 
Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, yes, Mayor. may I say something? So we'll go, I, I think in the order I saw, it was uh, Vice Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, Councilman Waring. So I heard. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I, so I guess my question, uh, Mayor, is how soon could we get someone to come in and give us recommendations, right? I guess it's one question. Um, I, I'd be more than happy to be able for us to sit down with that person as soon as possible. I don't know what what's realistic um, from that standpoint. Um, that's one question. And then the other thing, I don't know if the, maybe it's, I don't know if it's Tracy or Inger, but the same way as when we decided to close the parks and and we went through that process, I know that also took took some time, right? Because um, if we are gonna put CDC guidelines, we're gonna have to put up signage, we're gonna have to go through a whole process um, in order in order to get ready to open up the parks. And I'm not even exactly sure, um, you know, how long all of that's gonna take, you know, given that we have Labor Day weekend um, coming up as well. Mayor, Mayor, council member, we've indicated um, that it would take one week to open up for field usage. Um, if you want us to come back and talk about other amenities, we can do so with the timeline it would take to do that as well. Um, we are working on revised signage for all of our parks and amenities. So that would be placed out soon. We don't have the exact date, but we are working on that now. So you think that would take less than a week um, to put up signage and to come up with the language and all that? Mayor, council member, not for the language. I'm, I'm sorry, not for the signage. The signage is going to require that we get it reordered and then re get signage installed in various locations. But in terms of the new information and restrictions and guidelines, we would be informing those that are using our reservation and allocation system. So they would have that information. Th those individuals would have that. Um, one of the things also probably worth noting is we talked about an on-site compliance person, and we would ask the teams and organizations to wear something similar to a yellow vest while they were help facilitating the games and the practices. So um, our staff, if our rovers were out, would ha I have the person easily identified to talk with them about anything that they may not be complying with. Okay, because I, I, I mean, I just think that's, the reason why I think the motion makes sense, just because it gives enough enough time to do the signage that we need to do, to talk to the professionals that we need to talk to, um, and then and then to also like do some education. I know that it took when we closed stuff down, it took a while um, for people to understand what we were doing and and why we're doing it. Um, that's the reason why I think it it, it makes sense for us to I. I agree and I'm 100% on board that we have to go through a process to opening everything up. And, and I get it that kids are, are tired of being cooked up at home and people want to get out in the fields. But I also think that, you know, we, we, we just need to be able to do it in an organized way where we're educating everyone. And then when we're also out there, you know, we have all the information from the professionals that under that understand this and that we're able to do this the right way. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I believe it is next, Councilwoman Pastor, followed by Councilman Waring. I actually have a question about the restrooms and opening up the restrooms. Um, I want to know how many times they're going to be cleaned throughout the day and disinfected, or our hand sanitizer is going to be. I don't know what what that's going to look like. Mayor, Councilwoman, our restrooms, based on our staffing, will be cleaned as they were prior to COVID closings, which would be once a day. Um, we would encourage, educate our user groups, again, that they would be cleaned daily and encourage individuals to bring their own hand sanitizer and cleaning and or wipes as necessary for any use in the park, not just for the restrooms, but for any use in the park. So I find that a little dangerous. 
And the reason why I find that a little uh, dangerous is because there are requirements or people have put in requirements of cleaning the bathrooms at bars, at, uh, you can even see them at the stores. Uh, they're, they're, they have upped their cleaning um, in order to uh, prevent the virus. So I would like to also look at that and what that's gonna look like because I wanna add more than a daily cleaning. So I think we'll need time for that piece too. Councilwoman Pastor, Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, one of the things that um, we could consider as, as a use of the restrooms, they could only be opened if there was a reservation. So those are other things we could look at too. Only open them when there's a reservation so they would only be open for that time. No, I understand that, but if I go running into the bathroom, I'm hot, I take off my mask, I'm using the restroom, I cough, sneeze, whatever, um, I touch my face, turn around and touch the, because I don't know if all of them are automatic, uh, touch the sink, touch whatever, it's there. So I think we really need to look at, uh, for safety reasons, look at that piece. So it would be a good idea to take the time to do that as we open up. Mayor, Council Member Pastor, we are not currently staffed to clean uh, the restrooms more than once a day. However, if to your suggestion, the council would like to do that, that would be a, a use that we could use the coronavirus relief fund money for, and we would need to identify what we think that is for the council to make that decision. But that would be an added level of service, and so the council would need to understand that to your point to be able to make that um, decision for the use of that money. Right, and you know that's where I would like to talk to an expert to say what what are your what are your what are your thoughts on 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 this piece? Thank you, Councilwoman. We will go to Councilman Waring, and then if we do not have additional council member comments, we do have two members of the public who are very patient who have been waiting online, so we would like to go to them. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So, so again, I I appreciate because uh, I, I look at the statistics um, every day about you know how the COVID virus is, is impacting different parts of the city. So I understand that argument. I though would say, as I said everywhere and I would argue that that that's something that's in the same ballpark physical fitness and so forth indoors it's citywide statewide but it's citywide and it's already happening so one of my concerns with councilman Garcia's motion is the October 1st it just seems like a long way away given that it's per second so you know we could have people in we could have a special meeting to have experts in and I'm sure that could be arranged quickly uh, we're, we're talking about, I think, the subject in a broader sense um, on Tuesday. Again, could we try to get somebody in on Tuesday? And depending on what they say, I would hope that the park staff, uh, Tracy, have they certainly heard, I think, how this is going. There is definitely a broader interest in opening the parks. We just want to make sure you do it safely. So getting prepared for that should already be happening. So whatever time they're telling us this should take, hopefully we're gonna be chipping away at that. Really, I would hope that at least some thought was put into this as soon as that three person letter got submitted, but, but just in general, um, I would hope that, that they're starting now to be proactive, preparing staff and so forth. Now you could say preparing for what? Eventually reopening our, our parks. Um, that's something I think we just need to do. Uh, I do think, the bathroom issue that Laura brought up is, is a compelling one. Um, you know, personally, again, I've taken my kids to the park. I try to be prepared to not make a bathroom stop that they could be avoided. Um, I, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, Deb alluded to that. You know, the, the people who are paying a gym membership but aren't going to the gym. I'm not saying don't go to the gym, but, but there are people who are doing that because they're making their own personal health decisions. Um, I think the same goes for what facilities am I using when I'm out, if I'm going to a restaurant? What facilities am I using uh, when I'm at the park? And frankly, kids are going to school. 
I mean, just given what we know about this virus, being indoors, air conditioning, lots of other kids, fairly close quarters. I'm not a medical person, but that's got to be riskier than a lot of the activities that we're talking about, softball or what have you. Um, Inger, I don't think we ever – did we ever close down our tennis courts? Uh, Mayor – Is Inger there? Yeah, yeah this is Inger. Mayor um, – Councilman uh, Waring, uh, we did not uh, ever uh, close down the tennis courts. So, I mean, at some point, um, I just think, you know, we're letting people engage in activities in this sort of bailiwick, too. I tennis court answer already. I mean, I saw more people playing tennis on our court when this started. I happened to, happen to have a city park that's uh, between my house and the freeway. Uh, people were out playing. I, I'm a tennis player, so I noticed this. A lot of times the courts would be empty, but not when this started. There were people out there day and night, kids, classes. I mean, I think you and I talked about that at one point. Um, they were every bit as close as you see in a soccer match. I mean, at some point, I just think we should do it. I'd frankly be, be willing to vote for, I think, Councilman Garcia's motion if it weren't for the October 1st. I wish we were doing something more like as soon as we get the advice we need, like they're ready, rather than put a we're not going to do it until October 1st uh, label on it. So I do have a procedural question for staff. If was the ruling that Sal's motion doesn't count because we couldn't do it, and if that's the case, is then Councilman Garcia's motion now the first motion? And if so, is it eligible to have a substitute to it? Um, Mayor, members of the council, with, with the motion on the table and the uncertainty at the time, or the, the clarity at the time that that motion was perceived to be appropriate, I think this still counts, the Gar Councilman Garcia's motion is a substitute motion and there can only be one. Um, if this motion fails, you would go back to the first motion and, it, and the appropriate time to correct that motion in order to make it appropriate um, is still possible. If that motion fails, there could then be other motions made. Okay, so if both motions fail, we could still make another motion? Is that correct? Mayor, members of the council, Councilman Waring, yes, that's correct. But not today, can you? Yeah, I, I, you know, I was a little surprised by that answer, too. But yeah, I know. We've never been able to do that. Is that true, sir? Mayor, members of the council, the, the purpose, as we interpreted behind the rule about substitute motions and only one amendment, is to not have such complex motions that can't be filed and to keep them simple and to be efficient in moving things along. If those things fail, the point of the council meetings is for the council to make decisions and be able to adopt policy and give direction. Um, so trying to limit them to you know, one motion or one substitute on a given motion um, isn't consistent with that purpose. So what are you thinking about adding, Jim? <laughs> I was just thinking about basically saying we're going to get the medical advice um, as soon as possible, which to my mind should be Tuesday. Um, we've already got then a policy schedule. Mm -hmm. And then do it, do it citywide. Do it citywide because it sounds so, like the issue. Well, I, I thought your idea was a good one, but if the lawyers are saying we can't do it district by district, then yeah. do it citywide if it passes. Okay. You know, it's just an up or down. That. So, I want to. So, so let me ask you, Jim, then. I mean, I don't want to delay this any longer than we need to. We've got kids that are suffering right now. Um, you're saying, why don't you just put a date on it that we have to make a decision that the medical experts come back and say what, and then what's the next step is what I don't understand. I mean, do we go back to the council for another vote? And by then, we've already created the delay tactic that appears to be happening right here. Well, it's not a delay tactic. It's going to try to open up parks for everybody as quickly as possible for October 1st. And, Mayor, I'm sorry. Mayor, 
Uh, yes, I, I do uh, wish so, when Councilman Waring, when you are done, I will go to Councilmember Garcia. So, so I would say change to this is all based on Councilman Garcia's motion not passing, but it would be right. or if Councilman Garcia was willing to amend his motion, which I don't think has happened yet to take off the October 1st and we get some sort of certainty from who can we get in here on Tuesday. They give us advice and we open the parks pursuant to advice, whatever that advice is, or maybe it was Councilman Garcia. I just don't know that it's going to be real to have people at stations taking temperatures at every park. That, that's maybe we can get, with money to do that or what with money to do that but but then my expectations will make decisions for their own families and their own kids about what they want to participate in activities i think that there's going to be some risk i would argue as i've said it's probably less risky than going to school it's probably less risky than going to the gym and people are already doing that so this is a volunteer activity nobody's making it so under your I, idea, I would say though, both wait for a long time, but um, so actually, I'm trying to expedite it, not the opposite. Well, Jim, the only thing is under your idea. Councilman bro, uh, Garcia that. has the floor next. Oh, go ahead. Okay, you bet. Thank you, Mayor. And I, I thought Sal and Jim were just going to figure it out for the rest of us, but uh, thank you for having a process. Um, I'm willing. Uh, the reason I came up with October 1st, it wasn't that I pulled it out of thin air. It was hearing the city manager say that on the 16th, we could get information uh, from experts. I'm assuming that the experts are going to come with some recommendations, and that's going to take some time for us to figure that out. Similar to what Councilwoman Pastor brought out earlier around the restrooms, that topic hadn't been talked about. Now we need to figure out a plan for what's going to happen with that. And so my my inclination was it's going to take one week to implement to get the information out there to get a process out there, and I'm assuming it's going to take at least a week to talk through some of those things. So I would be willing to amend when we get the expertise. Two weeks after that date, I feel that that's ample time for uh, the staff to both figure out the new recommendations and then have a week of process to implement signage, forms, all that. And so I would be willing to amend my motion, Vice Mayor, I don't know how you were the second, um, to two weeks after we get the advice, um, we can reopen. If the advice would, is to reopen. I would support that. And Councilman, if we could get the advice from, for example, AIA's Sports Medical Committee, would you be comfortable with council members being able to to um, get individual briefings? And we we don't necessarily if we can do it more quickly without the, the, the council meeting. Can we just do it? I think the advice is for staff. I, I think we would be comfortable with it, but it's more around staff presenting the plan that they currently have. And then figuring out some of these other things, whether it's restrooms or other things that are happening. So, yes, if, if staff has a briefing or, or has the advice and we can figure it out, yes. So, whenever that gets done, that process gets done, I would say it would take two weeks for us to implement. That, that would be my suggestion. Thank you. And Councilwoman Pastor did bring up a good point about the restroom cleaning schedule. Um, my understanding is the Centers for Disease Control says that the lowest risk is to clean between each use and moderate risk is park staff clean and disinfect frequently touched surfaces and shared objects more than once per day. So that is something that we probably do need to look into and, and may be a worthwhile use of coronavirus relief fund dollars. It would just be good to understand what is the cost and availability of, of increasing that service that uh, service uh, we do have two members of the public who have been patiently waiting so i'm going to go ahead and go to the phones we will first begin with michael followed by dave devito michael you're unmuted 
Hi there. Thank you, Mayor and members of council uh, for bringing forward an agenda item on reopening parks. I wish to express my support of this agenda item and ask that the council please vote to open the parks today with Director Hall's presentation on controls uh, for youth organized sports. I'm here virtually speaking as an executive board member of our local Cal Ripken baseball, a four to 12 year old league with half of our families coming from North Phoenix. We have over 600 children signed up to resume playing baseball this fall amidst the COVID pandemic. But I'm also a father of a 10 year old baseball player and a 12 year old soccer player with reach 11 near and dear to our hearts. Uh, specific to our league, we have posted to our website as well as shared with Councilwoman Williams and Phoenix Parks, our return to play document. We know with baseball being a distance based sport, we can take proper precautions to limit contact and manage risk. The risk of inactivity, isolation and lack of socialization on children is taking its toll. I can see it with my own two kids playing outside in the open air, masks for coaches, frequent hand sanitizer breaks and distance between family members watching their kids play are all easy asks for opening the parks. Numbers have been brought below stated benchmarks. While opening parks comes with, all, with possible risk of infection, can we really keep parks closed for the waiting for the virus to fade away or for a vaccine to saturate deep enough into the public? In hearing council's debate in the last hour, why do you need more public health experts? Your parks director gave you uh, the CDC recommendations. Are they the experts? National Recreational Parks Association, are they not the experts? Um, and please remember, you are not the first, you are last. It's already been happening since June and with no known outbreaks at parks. Life comes with risks. We can diminish the likelihood of harm from this virus and still give our kids the joy of sports at Phoenix Parks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dave will be our final public comment on this item. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Mayor and council members for hearing this important agenda item today. My name is Dave DeVito. I'm a volunteer coach for all three of my boys recreational baseball and soccer teams, and I have been for several years now. While I support opening our city parks today, I'm merely a conduit for the voices of my three young boys who absolutely love sports and all others just like them. Every sport they play is more than a game to each of them. They love seeing their friends socializing, competing, and learning valuable life lessons along the way. They've already learned that anything they want to accomplish requires relentless hard work, and eventually it can be done. Just the other day, while playing catch with my boys in the yard, my oldest, who's also our most passionate, put his head down, left his brothers, and sadly moped into the house after he missed a ball. Later, when the other two were done, I went inside and asked him what was bothering him since I'd never seen that kind of behavior before. He told me he just doesn't feel like he's good at baseball anymore and doesn't understand why he can't easily do the things he once felt he had mastered. I tried to reassure him that even the most accomplished athletes will experience those issues when they haven't practiced or played for five months. I know several of you have mentioned you have young children in your lives, but I want you to understand that my son's emotions were real and it served as another harsh reminder that being isolated and removed from all the things that bring joy to our lives is not healthy. The recreational leagues we participate in have adjusted their policies and have implemented protocols to keep us safe even while outdoors. The general public has a greater understanding now about who's at serious risk than we did when the parks were closed five months ago. There are preventative measures we can take, and those who still aren't comfortable have made the decision to opt out we can make this work responsibly. Mayor and council members, as you vote today, please remember that our children are now asking you to open up Chase Field with tens of thousands of people. They're simply asking your permission to let them play outdoors again. Our leagues are at a breaking point right now. They need to know if fields are available or not before they can offer a fall season, which usually ends around Thanksgiving. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. So, uh, Councilmember Garcia, would you repeat the motion that is on the table for us now? Or we could have staff if that's easier. Yeah, yeah, that we'd open up the field uh, two weeks after we get the public health advice that we need. 
and we're ready to open. And staff feels comfortable with with implementing. And I would still okay. second that. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Roll call. Decisio. No. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Uh, Mayor, I'd like to explain my vote. Please do. So, you know, right now um, it's happening in our parks. We have children playing organized sports. Um, we're looking the other way right now. Uh, there's no reservations, no training on safety or social distancing going on right now. Uh, we need to take control of the park right now and not in a month from now. You know, we need to work with the teams and the organizations that are using them as soon as possible and to prevent the spread of, of the COVID-19. So I believe that by waiting, it just continues to spread. I believe that we need to educate people. Everyone around us is doing it. Uh, we need to make sure that if we're not going to be enforcing it and kicking people off of our fields now, then we we, we need, I'm going to be a no on this one. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Stark. Sorry, Mayor, if I can explain my vote. Um, Rose Mofford is one of the largest parks that offers soccer leagues. And um, I do agree with Councilman Nowakowski. I've seen kids out there playing and it is a little nerve wracking. And I think if we can get control of the open fields, and I think staff has presented a great idea. I'll be a no vote. Waring? No. Williams? No. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? I apologize, Gallego. Yes. Thank you. Fails four to five. We would now be back on we the next, original motion. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, we next go to the original motion. So uh, we would turn to Councilman DeCicio for any updates to his motion. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to change my motion to just say we're going to open it, but it takes into consideration the council members of those districts who should know more about what's happening in their district. I understand the concern that everybody has on this thing, but like the one caller said, we're not the first, we're the last to open at this point. And we really got to do this for these kids. I mean, these kids need to be able to be out in the field. They need to be out there playing. They needed that social interaction. They, this is like a critical time in their lives and they will never get this back. They will never get this time in their lives back. So from my end, I will be happy to make it to where we just open up the parks and um, it, it, based on the, uh, the recommendation of the council members that get weighed. And thank you for telling me that, Chris. And if it's okay with Zelda, I'd like to, is that okay with you on your, as a second? I'm not sure what your motion is. Mayor, Councilman to DeCicio, to if I can. Well, the, the motion is to open it up. Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead, I, I, if I can try to interpret what I understood the city attorney to, to say, what would need to happen would be that we would need to talk to each council member and then get their recommendation and then come back to the council to say a, a recommendation would be Council District 1 would be open, Council District 2 would be closed, Council District 3 would be open. You would have to vote on an entire package of that, specifically oh. saying district by district. So we could take your recommendation, but no. the council would have to vote Let's not do on that, then. that. Okay. No, 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 we gotta get this over with today. We've been at this for so long. So the motion then council is just to open it up. Yes, count, uh, yes, Father. open them all at this point. The parks department's timing and um, difference. I mean, they're making recommendations for health purposes, and I think that's important. But I agree. I think we just say we're going to be open, which would probably be a week or so. 
Yeah, exactly. I, I'm, I'm, and I that's second. Where I, that, that's my motion then. There you go. Thank you for that. Yeah, let's just open then. Let's not make it confusing. Let's keep it simple. And um, that's it, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Pestor. When you say make it open, are we just saying the fields? Or are we saying opening up all of it? Well, I'm saying fields. I'd like to open up the fields for sure. Yeah, the fields for sure. I'd like to do that. I mean, these kids, I mean, I hate to be this blunt, but these little kids have to pee somewhere. And not to allow them to be able to go in the bathroom is a big deal. So, but we could also look at have staff come back to us a little later of how they're going to do the cleaning of the bathroom to make sure that the children are safe. Yes, thank you. Can you put that in your motion? I think we are only agendized for the fields. Yeah. Mayor, that's correct. What we would say is that uh, accessory to the fields would be the restroom facilities that, the, that support those specific fields, not all restroom facilities in parks. So that was part of the of the um, Ms. Hall's presentation, and we could then come back with what it would take to um, add the extra, the more than one day, once a day cleaning, as you as you noted. Councilman Pestor. So let me get the motion clear: it is to open up all the fields and only the bathrooms that are associated with the fields are all the bathrooms in the park only those associated with the fields that are opened yes and then on tuesday we could add to the to our discussion next tuesday we could do our quick research on the additional cost to add extra cleanings to those restrooms and we could have that information for you on Tuesday with our um, coronavirus update. Is there uh, any additional council member comments? Oh. So the motion on the table is to reopen parks consistent with uh, the staff presentation and to come back to the council with an estimate for additional cleaning for the restrooms associated. The motion would include only the restrooms associated with the fields. Is Councilman DeCicio and staff, did I get that okay? That's staff's understanding, uh, Councilman DeCicio. Is he on? That's what the motion was. Okay, then I think uh, we are ready for roll call. Decisio. Garcia. Mayor Max, may my vote? Please do. I really think we need to do this better be more smart about it, prepare our staff better. Um, and I apologize to them because I feel like in the next coming weeks as they open up, we're gonna get calls and we're gonna be bugging you. And I wish we would just gave ourselves a couple more weeks to make sure that we did this right. Um, before that, I can't, because of that in good conscience without having the right uh, public health advice and a, a plan thought out, I do not feel comfortable opening it up just like that. So I'm a no. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Mayor, I want to explain my vote. Please do. 
So I cannot be supportive of this. Like I said, I have the highest cases um, are in Maryvale. I think we're fighting over 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 two weeks, which I think are key and important to support our staff and to support everyone that would be coming into the parks. Um, I'm going to be voting now. Before I get to you, Mayor, it, it appears we're having a, a little bit of an issue with the phone. I wanted to check we have one phone on. Is that Councilman DeCicio or Councilman Waring? Um, this is Councilman Nowakowski. He called me and asked asked me to put it on my speakerphone. So I got him on my speakerphone. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of weird. Thank you. I, it's bizarre. I tried calling Councilman Elder Williams to call the others. But my vote is yes. Thank you. And it looks like maybe we have Councilman Waring. In the interim, I'll get your vote, Mayor. Yes, I'm quite confident Councilman Waring will be a yes if we can get him. But. Councilman Waring is, is telling me that he's on and he can't hear anything. I, so, Mayor, if we could just check with our technical staff, do we have any luck with Councilman Waring? Let's see if I can call. I guess while you uh, uh, work with our technical team, I, I will uh, explain my vote. I believe this proposal is consistent. On speak on my speak. Okay. I'm sorry, Mayor Gallego, I do have Councilman Waring. Let's hear it. Waring. Yeah, I'm here. Would you? What is your vote, Councilman Waring? The city clerk is is calling uh, for the, your vote, Councilman. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So I, I'm sorry. I couldn't hear anything for for several minutes there. So this is the motion. Open up. Wearing? He, yes, Councilman, he, he's asking, yeah. Denise, oh, can you say motion. what the motion is, please? I apologize. The motion is to reopen the parks and, uh, and the associated bathroom facilities and then come back on Tuesday policy session with more information related to the costs for cleaning the bathrooms more than once a day. So, Councilman, that's the motion in there calling for your vote. I, I didn't really hear that. No. This is just to open up the parks that we talked about before, correct? Correct. This is opening the parks yep. uh, with the that associated was... bathrooms, and then we'll have cleaning schedules on those. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. I, I couldn't hear what you said. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Mayor Gallego. Thank you. And I, I feel like I got to point out that the council members who are using WebEx are having a little bit of an easier time. As I, I started to say when Councilman Waring joined us again, this proposal seems consistent with Senators for, Centers for Disease Control guidelines about parks. We do believe that outdoor, that uh, indoor spread is much more linked to COVID and that there are fewer cases related to outdoor activities. Um, numerous groups, including the Medical Sports Advisory Council for AAA, have looked at this and developed similar proposals. So I, we will keep, continue to monitor and, and see what happens. But at this point, I believe this is responsible. I vote aye. Motion passes 7 to 2. That concludes our agendized items Welcome for to today's. Webex. Formal you are the meeting. first person to join the meeting. Please stand by. Did it pass? It passed seven to two. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, we will now move to the public comment portion of our meeting. I will turn to our city attorney to introduce public comment. I am a little bit worried about quorum, so I'll ask our city clerk to continue to let me know if we do lose quorum. Uh, with that, city attorney, uh, could you please introduce public comment? Mayor, members of the council, during citizen comment, members of the public may address the city council for up to three minutes on issues of interest or concern to them. 
The Arizona Open Meeting Law permits the City Council to listen to the comments, but prohibits Council members from discussing or acting on the matters presented. Thank you so much. We do have uh, three individuals here to address the Council. We'll begin with Kellen Wilson, followed by Laura Perez. You did. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, hi, Mom. this is Kellen Wilson. Um, I, um, you know, I don't know if all of the council members are there. Everybody went off of their video. Um, I think that I'm probably just speaking to the YouTube channel that will be up on the website, um, which I find uh, insulting as we waited just as long as all of you did to speak. Oh, there's Michael Nowakowski. Thank you so much. So um, I wanted to remind the council that um, hospitality workers still have no relief and have only received layoff letters and loss of health insurance during this pandemic, although you bailed out their employer with uh, millions in rent relief. Um, also, we held a food bank last week and gave our members uh, over a hundred, passed out over 120 grocery cards to our members as people are urgently and desperately in need of food during this time. Um, I was very, really uh, appalled by the whole conversation that just went on about city parks. Um, it took, you know, over an hour plus to discuss a safe reopening while most of the council sat at home to have that conversation. Um, while folks who go to work every day or try to keep our places open and run the city, um, you know, are out braving the uh, conditions that you are discussing. Um, actually, Sal DeCicio did a very, Councilman DeCicio did a really good job of explaining the disparities between uh, access to health care and access to healthy conditions and wage disparity and wealth disparity. Um, a very large amount of our members live in District 5, 6, and 7 over 2,000 of our 3,000 members. Um, and they are the people who work at the airport. They are the ones who run the hospitality industry. And um, it was very clear to watch the council um, devalue their family and their family's health through the, um, the hospitality ordinance conversations. And then again, through the city park um, conversation as well. Thank you for your time. Mayor, this is the clerk. I just wanted to clarify, we do have a quorum, including uh, Councilman Waring on the phone. Wonderful, thank you to our folks in IT who have been working for creative solutions. We appreciate it. Uh, Laura will be followed by Yolanda. And on the hospitality ordinances when we were telling you what we were experiencing. Um, I want to remind the council that in the month of their, of your recess, three people have been murdered by the police. I and tons of my coworkers for almost six months haven't been working or still laid off. Homeless folks haven't had the access to bathrooms to wash their hands in a global pandemic. And I'm also calling to share my personal experience on what I've been seeing during this pandemic, talking to coworkers who are still working, talking to folks who like me are laid off. And the reasons I think it's super important to support these three ordinances. First, safety training. I just went into my hotel this past week with an issue that I wanted to address with HR. I saw several coworkers without masks. They didn't seem to comprehend the importance of mask wearing and they need more training on it. I saw managers as well without masks. Extra sick time. I have gone to work sick because I couldn't afford not working especially now we really want to encourage people to stay home 
most of my jobs haven't had sick time and I and many of my coworkers have used the sick time and PTO that we have accumulated to help get us through this pandemic. And lastly, on recall rights, it's been six months since I haven't worked. It would be a huge weight off my mind to make sure that we have longer um, assurances that our jobs are still going to exist. Folks have already started getting fired at my hotel. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Yolanda will be our final speaker, and I understand she will be using interpreter interpretation. Yolanda. My name is Yolanda Hernandez. I live in the city of Phoenix. And I work in the hotel that is in Tempe. I, I'm in favor of the ordinances in regards to the safety of hospitality. because the six days that I have for my company is not enough. It's not enough for time of recuperation in case we do get sick. I, w I got sick with the virus and I was sick for, for more than two weeks. On July 22nd, until now. Having more time, having more sick time is essential so that we can get better. We, I understand that working is very important because we need to pay our bills, but what's more important is to stay home for the safety of those around us. We are very important for the job that we do, and we want to be able to take care of ourselves. And, and my coworkers and our, our um, health. And that's why I am in favor of the audiences. Thank you very much. Mayor. We do have one yes. more person on the line that had re requested to speak, Don Amadin. Thank you. Uh, Don, the floor is yours. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, great. Uh, my name is Don Amadin. I'm, I work with um, LSC Sky Chefs. I've been uh, laid off since uh, the first week of April. Um, waiting to get back, and, and um, I've been uh, one of the few lucky ones out there and be, have been able to uh, get my unemployment and everything, and, and, and um, I got through it pretty pretty easily, I guess, and I'm, I'm at the last month of this now to where uh, the company is being paid by the feds to uh, keep my paycheck coming, um, but at the end of September, first week of October, that ends, and they were talking about sending out layoff notices if they weren't up to, uh, up to uh, um, work levels that they needed to be to, to, to keep people on, and they were going to send out layoff let notices and so on. Um, if that happens, uh, the ordinances that you're going to pass, um, at least two of them will benefit me, and I'm hoping that you will pass them uh, to protect me from uh, completely losing the job. As it is, I'm going to be losing my um, uh, medical benefits uh, at that time as well. And I'm uh, an at-risk individual as far as my uh, immunosystem and medications as I'm uh, diabetic and so on. Um, so please consider the people out there that have my type of uh, situation when you uh, vote to pass these ordinances and help us out. Um, we do a lot of the work that keeps these uh, 
the airport going and so on at the jobs that we do. Um, that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. That concludes today's formal meeting of the Phoenix City Council. We are adjourned.